Sanchez for being here tonight with us. I will call this meeting of Montgomery County School Board to order at 7 o'clock on August 7, 2018. Please stand for Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our next item will be adopting our agenda. May I have a motion to adopt our agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have an agenda. Next item will be Dr. Meyer's announcements. Thank you. And uh, welcome back. Yes, welcome back. Uh, <laughs> we consider this the first uh, meeting of the new school year, and so very, very excited. I hope everyone had a, had a wonderful summer. Um, I know I did. And so um, um, today, actually, the, the new teachers started, and uh, I believe we hired 92 uh, new teachers this year, uh, which is about the same every year. Yes, it is pretty pretty normal um, but they start they had a great uh, orientation day um, all, all teachers will start on Thursday um, and of course the big day is next Wednesday when um, about 9,500 kids uh, uh, many of them get on the bus and, and come back to school so I'm very excited about it for five kids of my own to go back to school <laughs> and so, um, and so we're, we're very excited about that um, a lot of great news this summer uh, for one uh, for the first time since 2011 all of all 20 of our schools are fully accredited so I'm just very excited um, we received the first um, ever uh, workforce readiness award for the top school division between five and ten thousand students um, and, and so we won that award from the Department of Education. Many of us went to Richmond to receive that award, but our work-based inter internship program is uh, one of the best in the state. And so just real excited about that too. Um, something else that, that I would like to announce um, uh, tonight is, is, is an interesting piece of data. And that is, um, I think it was in February or March, uh, we had a group of uh, 10th grade students at Blacksburg High School take the PISA exam. And what the PISA exam is, it actually ranks students. Uh, it's a worldwide test. And, um, and every year the results come out. And um, usually the United States as a whole ranks between 10 and 15 in science and um, uh, reading and, and um, math. And so what we wanted to do was to see actually how do our students compare um, to students of the world. We know where we are as a country, and of course, um, you know, a lot of folks give public education a hard time in the United States because we're ranked around 13, 14, 15 in the world in these areas. And so I wonder, you know, how would our top students at, at, um, at Blacksburg High School uh, fare in this, um, in this test? The last time the, um, the uh, results were released as a world in reading, math, and science, Singapore was uh, actually was the top country in the world um, in terms of test results. And, uh, I, I, and I'll say Finland is in the top three usually. And, and I got the idea of giving our students this test because I went to Finland last year and they talked about the great things they do and they do a lot of wonderful things. But I thought, you know, we do some of the, the same great things. And so I, I wonder how our kids actually would do. So Singapore was top in reading, math, and in science. And our, our top students um, outscored Singapore in all three areas. We beat everyone in the world at Blacksburg High School. And so that's something to celebrate. Uh, in reading, Singapore scores were um, 535, ours were 596. Math, 564, ours were 650, almost 100 points difference. Um, and in science, 556. Our top students were 608. And so um, I, I think we're doing real well in Montgomery County. We're outscoring the world 
in, in terms of a norm test. And so um, we're real excited about that, and, and, and please get that news out there. And, and if you're in, with the news here, please, I'd love to talk to you about it. So uh, but, we're, but we're real excited <laughs> about that and excited about this upcoming school year. So thank you. Ms. Cron, yep. The next item will be our awards and recognitions, and it's back to you, Dr. Yes, uh, um, uh, Dr. <coughs> Graham, if you'll come to the podium to assist with our awards, honors, and recognitions, we'd appreciate that. Good evening. This is a, an exciting time of the night when we honor and uh, recognize great accomplishments within the division. And for our awards tonight, I would like to call Annie Whitaker, Director of Human Resource Resources, up to uh, recognize our support employees of the year. Good evening. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, as you know, tonight we have the great opportunity to honor some of our employees within the school division. <clears throat> You know, lots of times you hear about schools and we think just about teachers. And it's not just teachers. There are lots and lots of employees who work together to make our school division run. And we couldn't make it day to day without them. So it's really important that we recognize them. The way the process works is each uh, school or department is given an opportunity to nominate an individual. And then from all of those who are nominated from their school or division, we select one overall winner. So what we're going to do today is share with you those folks who were nominated from their school or facility and have them come up and then we'll also talk about our overall winner as well. So first we'd like to, if you guys want to go ahead and line up, there we go. While they're doing that, I'll read the names of the folks who were not able to make it tonight. Karen Cecil, Betty Daniels, Jackie Dobson, Callie Dupree, Bobby Hale, Robin Hilton, Sandra Keith, Darlene Lester, Michelle Meredith, Raquel Sisson, Michael Trujillo, Melanie Wall, Karen Witt, April Dowdy, and Douglas Harless. Okay. okay, first we have Carrie Bradshaw, who is an administrative assistant with us from Falling Branch Elementary School. All right. Next is Debbie Foster, custodian at AMS. <laughs> Joyce Midkiff, who's an administrative assistant at EMHS. <laughs> Lori Mitchum, cafeteria manager at AES. Tina Morrell, Administrative Assistant at Montgomery Central. <laughs> David Skip Thompson, Grounds Worker with our Facilities Department. <laughs> and Vicki Wall, an Instructional Assistant at Price's Fork Elementary School. And our overall winner this year was Bruce Bentley, who is a computer technician. He was named the MCPS Support Staff Employee of the Year and has worked with Montgomery County for 13 years. Bentley was nominated for his initiative in managing almost 10,000 Chromebooks in the division, setting them up, delivering them to schools, completing repairs, maintaining inventory, and preparing every device for its user. These are just a few of the things that take up his time. We'd like to recognize Bruce Bentley at this time.
At this time, we will take a five minute break so that all the board members may congratulate those who were honored tonight. It's for citizens to address the board about issues pertaining public education in the county. Each speaker is allowed a three minutes to speak and screens throughout the room and the laptop will indicate that speaker has 30 seconds remaining. I do not have any individuals sign up at this time. Is there anyone on the audience who would like to address the board? Hearing, hearing now, the public address is closed. <laughs> The next item is our consent agenda. Any questions regarding the consent items, uh, board members? If not, we approve them as it is, as they are. They're all the old, our old um, minutes and field trips and two grant proposals, one for Christiansburg High School Black Student Awareness Club and the other one, I believe, Blacksburg High School Black Awareness Black Student Awareness Club grants. Are we all good? Then we approved our consent agenda. The next item, paying our bills. We have three. Sorry. We have three bills to pay, so we'll approve them separately. May I have a motion to approve 2017-18 year-end bill payments? So moved. <laughs> Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Do we have a second? Sorry. Okay. Second. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I wasn't sure. There were two, two moves, I think. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the July 18 bill payments? So moved. Second. Any discussion regarding those? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We pay those bills. May I have a motion to approve August 7 bill payments? Motion. <laughs> second. I have a motion and second. Uh, any discussion regarding those? That? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We paid all our bills. The next item is our business meeting and starts with the board member reports. Any board members would like to share what they did since, since June? <laughs> I can you want to go, go Ms. Sure. Graham? Sure. Um, so um, even though we didn't have any meetings, I certainly was still very busy from the school board side. We had the uh, Montgomery County Educational Foundation board retreat um, planning for this upcoming year. I attended Camp Invention um, at Christiansburg Middle School and it's always amazing what those students are doing. And this year, um, it seemed like the projects from Camp Invention <coughs> were um, better than I've seen them in the past. And one of them was um, building a house and what inventions do you think would benefit people in the next 10 years? Um, and so that was really neat because one of them was a, a washer and dryer that does self laundry and dries and hangs it. I like that. <laughs> I'm like, that'll be a good patent. I'll take that first. I'll, I'll beta test it. <laughs> um, and then uh, we of course had our school board retreat and we um, did the 100, Along with that, we did the 100th bus presentation from Thomas Merriman, um, which was quite exciting. And that was a great presentation, being able to see the bus drivers there. And um, I also participated, well, I judged the bus rodeo that they had in Roanoke that some of our folks went to, um, as well as other counties. I uh, went to the VSBA ed Education Conference that Dr. Meyer mentioned previously, where we got the very first um, award that has ever been given out for the workplace readiness. And then lastly, um, this past week, I went to the teaching tolerance workshop with the administrators, which was absolutely amazing. It was, I, I'm very glad I chose to do that. Thank you, Ms. Graham. Mm -hmm. Me? Okay, yeah. now that I got my iPad going, I'm good. Sure. Um, well, I've been following Marty around, so, you know, I've got the same thing she's got. 
<laughs> so um, I'll just share because I'm really bad about, we were doing, I was just telling Connie earlier that, you know, I'm not in practice about taking notes and listening at the same time when I'm at a conference. So it's a real struggle. I'm trying to listen and write down. And by the time you write it down, they've moved on two slides. And it's just, so I'm not a good <laughs> presentator. I'm bringing back what I've, I've heard. Um, but the conference that we, I did get to go to because it was on a Tuesday for the Viet on Education, which we did get the award. It was very, very great. I loved it because it was a round table type um, atmosphere and that's so much better, I think. Um, but there was a guy who was speaking, one of the keynote speakers, and I think everybody had seen him before, maybe I hadn't, but he was talking about that he was into the bikes and all this kind of stuff and um, he had moved on to being a, a, like a hands-on type teacher. And he had, you know, that everybody now students have lack of soft skills, which I truly agree. And he was phenomenal. I thoroughly enjoy him. And one of the things I really grabbed from him is he said, experience making a gift for somebody. And I've been saying that for years, like at Christmas, quit buying, make somebody something. Because it's truly, truly, um, it, it just does something different. And I kind of rated my, the, con the sessions that I went to is all in one room, of course, as everybody knows. But all of mine were great. <laughs> Now, we went to the same ones on the solar. I, I wasn't thrilled with that because I don't think they were very informative. I don't think they did a good job. Right. But I liked the idea. I just didn't think they did a good job explaining to somebody like me that doesn't have a clue mm -hmm. about it. It was very like I left not knowing any more than when I sat down. But the other three were great. Um, one of the ones that I truly enjoyed listening to, and sh I think she had done a great job, was restoring discipline. and what they pretty much the whole basis of it was if say if someone did graffiti on a wall they did an estimate with the maintenance they sat down with the the maintenance uh, group found out exactly how many man hours what it would cost to fix it and took the student with the parent and sat down and they had to actually um you know kind of say i'm sorry it, it was a it, they had to face what they had done and then they worked those hours to work it off so it was a real hands-on kind of deal and I like that because I think now we just kind of say okay you're out or you're in this or you're in that and then somebody else cleans up and fixes the mess and I just really believe if you did it you need to clean it up so um, I really was all about that and, and she uh, you know shared some books and things that they did and that it was a step-by-step -step learning process and sometimes it was hard for people to sit down and face each other but they found it to be very rewarding and that the students once they had to look at another student in the eye and say you know I'm so sorry it truly was much more meaningful than just you know yeah I'm sorry I'm sorry so that was that was a great session and uh, of course I'm really into CTE and so the, one of the ones was the uh, learn I can't even remember exactly where they were from, but they were just talking to Goochland County. I should have known that. And they had Cat Pil Caterpillar and Lucky Companies, which was a, a rock quarry, and which made me think, you know, we've got a rock, couple rock quarries pretty close, and I don't know if we've used those, but they instituted into their career and technical education heavy equipment operating. And we have a lot of that around here, and I know some heavy equipment companies, and they're making bank. So. Um, Anyway, that was really neat. And they just went and kind of said, we want you to come in and we want, and some of those companies let them borrow their equipment. And they said, you know, we'll come get it if we need it. Now, maybe we haven't been as blessed to have that happen, but there might be somebody out there who's willing to do that. So that was really, really neat too. Um, then I went to one from Isle of Wight and they were talking about building relationships. And the thing I took away from that was they were just kind of saying, you know, whether you're working with your teachers or your administrators, use common language because as I've said the whole time I've been on the board, all of the different little things that as educators you guys know, I don't know. And so it's really hard for me to follow. And the average person is me. You know, that's, that's who the community is. And if we want the community, and as I've said this a thousand times, to buy into the school system, you gotta talk to them with common language. You can't use the language that, you know, everybody knows <laughs> except for ones like me that aren't in the system. And, um, and if there's nothing wrong with that, it's just I'm just, I thought that was kind of cool how they said that. That way everybody's on the same page. Everybody knows what everybody means and what everybody's talking about. Um, and they actually used these things called um, focus documents, which I thought was really, really neat too. And I brought them back. Let me just find them for you. 
But it and it was something that they. Well, I don't know what I did. Did I leave them down there with you, Brenda? No, here they are. But it was really neat too. And they actually gave us each one of them, and and it explained out. And I know we have stuff like this, but they kind of gave this to every every person, every every everybody, parent, student, teacher. So there again, everybody knows exactly. Anyway, so that was. That's me. <laughs> That's all I have. I came home. I went shopping and then came home. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Buck. Ms. Franklin? Oh, okay. So, um, as Ms. Graham said, we had our board retreat, uh, which is always interesting. We also, um, you know, did that 100,000th bus. Well, folks, the bus was just a regular bus. <laughs> Nothing different. Same, yellow. Yep. Okay. But what I took away from that was at the luncheon, the uh, folks had drivers from across the state. They had mechanics. They had other uh, boards. And they also gave away a scholarship. So they had the president of the university there, too. So my biggest takeaway from that whole event was there were a lot of people who came together, who make those buses happen, to keep those buses going. They even had folks from the manufacturing floor there. So um, that was my big takeaway is, you know, it's not just the board members who put out the money for those buses. It was actually all the people who were involved across the region who helped make that company successful and make good buses for us. Um, let's see, I had a couple things down. Went to um, our summer, uh, graduation, which was just wonderful. Um, small group of students, and we got to hear, you know, what those students had accomplished, what they're looking forward to be to do uh, in the future. And <clears throat> folks sometimes, uh, I believe, think that our summer school graduates are folks who just got behind and they're trying to hustle to try to just get that diploma, which is absolutely not true. You know, for whatever reason, these students have chosen or they're in at a summer school graduation and sometimes it's just because I want out of here early okay yep. Yep. and others it's just this is what I want to do it was just amazing what those students were uh, aiming to accomplish <coughs> now that they're out of Montgomery County Schools so you know again it's one of those stigma things that we need to make sure folks understand what that's all about yeah. I also uh, was at a uh, union meeting this weekend and was able to um, hear about a uh, apprenticeship program developed by the Department of Labor with money that goes along with it. So I'll just pass that on to Dr. Myers and hopefully we will be able to uh, uh, use some of those funds and resources to step up our apprenticeship programs. So I'm hoping to see how that might work out. That's exciting. Thank you, Ms. Franklin. Ms. Fred? Sure. So, um, uh, unfortunately, I was not able to attend our board retreat. I was out of the country at the time, so I did not get to see the bus. <laughs> um, it was yellow. <laughs> it was yellow. <laughs> it was much there, as far as the bus goes, at least. Um, but, you know, people are more interested in the buses anyway. <laughs> so, uh, but um, I did do some participation electronically while I was gone, <laughs> tried to. Um, I did get to attend um, the conference on education when I got back and um, went to some of the same sessions and a couple of different ones, so I'll talk about a couple of those. Um, one that I attended was the teen mental health, and I'm going to defer to uh, Ms. Karan on that one because I know she went to that one and yep. took some wonderful notes and has some data on that, so I'm going to defer to her on that one. Um, interesting, I, we both also attended the school law update which centered a lot around the new regulations involving student suspension and each year now we keep getting bills coming to our legislatures legislators um, asking us to limit suspensions and uh, in particular a lot of what we were seeing were limiting suspensions in elementary school and you know your first thought there is why do we need suspensions in elementary school but unfortunately we do and um, another session I went to actually tied into that, and it was, it was part of the discipline, um, like what Ms. Bond went to, it was a different session on discipline. And this was, 
it was a cross between alternative ed and ISS, so it was spelled somewhere there in between. And in this particular case, they were implementing it in middle school, but they talked about how, because basically what they were doing was alt ed, but on the campus of where the student's home school was, how that could be done in the elementary setting. We, of course, do not have an alt ed center for elementary. Fortunately, I don't know that we've had a great need for it, but I've been to conferences and met with other superintendents and board members who regularly can have three to five kids from, of elementary age in some sort of alternative ed setting. So just some good information on should the need ever arise, how you might implement something like that at the school campus. Um, another session I went to was, it was about classroom design to cultivate, it says classroom design to cultivate cultivate deeper learning in mathematics. So it's a mathematics teacher, and he had started as a fourth grade teacher and eventually made his way to high school where he was teaching algebra primarily to ninth, 10th, and 11th graders. And of course, he started the session by saying, I think all of you here know if I'm teaching algebra one to ninth, 10th, and 11th graders, I'm teaching it to the kids who have either struggled all the way through or are taking it for the second, third time. And he sort of took what he had learned as an elementary teacher, and this is not dumbing down mathematics, but this is, this is applying a different culture to how you teach math. And it w started with the classroom setting. And it wasn't you know five by five desks lined up with a teacher standing in front. It was more like centers and stations. There were a lot more manipulatives, and there was a lot more self-teaching and collaboration going on between the students. So he would start his week lecturing, but then the next three days, they were working together in groups at different stations to help teach each other mathematics, but also he would come and help them. And then at the end of the week, you know, they would come back together and see what they had learned as a group. And um, he had pass rates in the 90s after, as a result. And these were, mm -hmm. like I said, mostly kids who had failed mathematics. So. Coming from a math background, it was nice to hear. And, and also, because of the foundation, we've gotten a lot of grants for things that he put in that classroom, but all the grants we requests we've gotten have been from elementary teachers for things like active seating and um, manipulatives and things like that. But it just goes to show that, and I think we all know this, because we're going to talk about recess, our older kids need that activity level as well. Mm -hmm. They can't just sit in a classroom for 45 to 90 minutes a day being lectured to. Mm -hmm. They need to be active. So that I thought was really, really interesting. And then the last one I ended up with, um, which was sort of a fun one, but it was really neat. Um, the Spotsylvania County, they do a culture festival. This is a division-wide festival where they bring together art, music, and theater. And they do a, um, so this, they hold their all-county band and their all-county choir at this. They have their art display, including like their Scholastic yeah. Gold Key Award winners there. They Oh, and foreign language, that was the other thing they brought in. So they did similar to what I think Beaks does, where you had food being served mm -hmm. from various countries of the, you know, the language the kids had studied. Um, and then you had theater doing performances. So all of this was going on at one time mm -hmm. in one place, and they would alternate between their high schools. So you know, everybody got to host it. Uh, at some point. It was a really idea. nice way. And what it really did was bring in the community to see what we're doing in our schools. Because typically, when you just have a school event, you're only going to see the parents, parents maybe some grandparents. But they advertise it as a community event, um, and they had food and things like that. And they could do fun, you know, they allowed some of the groups to sell, like, do bake sales, some raffles, to, and some raffles and things like that. So it worked as a fundraiser as well. But it got the community to come in and see all those different, you know, extracurriculars and electives. So I really liked how they did that. Yeah, they can replace you do that countywide. Yeah. yeah. And of course, I did host about. the um, <laughs> MCEF board retreat yeah. um, at, at uh, my house and led that. <laughs> and of course, going along with that, we did open our grant cycle on August 1st. So if you go to our website, it's up. It will be up until midnight on October 8th. Uh, and we've already received our first first application so we are <laughs> up and running 
And then the last thing I did last Thursday, <laughs> I want to thank my bocce ball partner sitting over here, Mark Husband, <laughs> our new CTE director. Rain. We braved the rain for three hours <laughs> to play bocce ball, and it was with the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce, and that is their annual fundraiser that um, supports our Teacher of the Year program. So. <laughs> It was, it was fun. <laughs> we did come out with a respectable three and two record. Mm -hmm. So we were better than 50-50, but fortunately not good enough to make it the tournament, so we got to go home. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. And after you got, yes. but we got out of the rain after three hours. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Do you know how big a county is, Spustin Um, It sounded like they were is similar. Similar, so, yeah, I, I was just wondering that. Just based on the number yeah, of schools, based on the it, number, sound, yeah. it sounded similar. Uh, I think the last one will be me. Uh, I did a lot of traveling. I went to Richmond twice in uh, Charlottesville once. Seems like all, all my time went on 64 uh, during July. The first one was um, July 11th, the VSPA Legislative Position Committee meeting in Charlottesville. I represent Blue Ridge Region at that committee and basically they will look at the proposals from school boards and then um, they will um, amend or reject or um, approve and then it goes to the VSPA board of directors and then after they swept through, it will go to delegate assembly in uh, um, November when VSPA have the annual meeting. So the delegates from 132 divisions will say yay or nay those priorities and this time around there were 18, uh, 13 proposals from six school boards, Bristol City, Fairfax, Goochland, Prince William, Roanoke City, and Virginia Beach. Uh, one of the, you know, I don't want to go through all those. Most of them got, with a little amendment, uh, approved, and I, I think passed that information to Ms. Graham. I'm hoping I did. If I haven't, I will do, so okay. you will have it before before uh, November as our uh, representative there. But one uh, from Roanoke City was interested, and I shared that information with uh, Dr. Meyer already. I never thought about that could be a problem, but their uh, legislative position is um, to be able to universally t to test color blindness. They realize that color blindness actually affects so many of our students, especially SOL test time, when they think on the screen highlighted yellow, blue, or orange, red, and if they can't tell the difference, what part of the map, map you know, highlighted, or you know, what question that needs to be looked at. Uh, you know, a lot of um, you know, failing students for that in that area. So they try to push a legislator to say we'll have a funding so we will do universal colorblind tests for, this, for their students. So I thought that was interesting and I was curious about if it's an issue for our county or if we ever know how many numbers do we have or do we you know, even test, especially lower socioeconomic uh, families that they don't take their kids on a regular basis to eye doctor. That was a that was a big big issue, and I never thought that could be a you know issue in test taking, and I think most of the kids then label as ADHD even though they are not, but they just can't see to um, answer any questions. So I thought that was uh, that was an eye opener for me. And then I went to of course VSBA conference with my uh, colleagues, and I attended mini workshops on teen mental health restorative justice, gifted identification for equity, and everything you need to know about public procurement and new limitations on student suspension and expulsion under Virginia law. Uh, I pass all the information to the related parties, uh, but regarding the teen mental health, and I shared that, I shared that too, and I shared gifted identification with Ms. Naff uh, as well, and I passed the teen mental health to uh, Ms. Hippel and Ms. Baldwin. With the teen mental health, the Suffolk City assistant superintendent was there sharing the information and basically they train all their 10th graders and 8th graders regarding mental health basically with the suicide and they watched a 24 minute video done by the students and then and, 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 and they talked about it, discussed, but the facilitators were through the um, American Association of uh, Prevention of Suicide group. And then if you look at their site, they said there are local foundations that are, you know, because a foundation is born, somebody lost a child for that and they wanna help the communities and they, you know, give all the tapes free, uh, all the 
people that are going to go through the um, training free? Because my first question was how much that will cost. Because I know it's important, you know, whether we have to allocate, you know, budget for it. I mean, even though mental health is number one for me, at least. Um, so that was interesting, and I hope we will look into. And and then they did it in the classroom, and they train so many of their students, so many of their faculty, and they are down to training their bus drivers uh, and you know aides and uh, everybody that greets and uh, talks to kids. So that was a really important one. I don't know if I'm missing. Yeah. anything else and I gave all the numbers and the statistic because they send a survey after that and so many students actually said you know 90 percent I'm pretty sure that they said wow you know now we know you know if we see something it, at least we will approach the person and ask or give the direction that they can go and ask help uh, so it was really eye-opener for the students to go through that training and then I was, um, I attended with a um, group of educators to July 23rd, on the July 23rd and July 24th to Virginia for All Learners Equity in Education Conference. And I miss you, Ms. Franklin, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And the sessions were, of course, incredible. And I know, uh, you know, the information, sh you know, shared. And I know Ms. Diggs was uh, with me, Ms. Hippo was with me. And, um, you know, one session was uh, interesting. Uh, I mean, they were all interesting. It was so hard to fit all the summary here. But the Fairfax, um, I know it's a big county. It's hard to compare. But they did the journey creating a joint equity policy. And what they did is their board of supervisors and their board, school board both decided this equity is a priority. And they sit around the table and they develop a policy, you know, uh, so it's not just equity within our students in school system, but it's also equity uh, you know, within the res residents uh, or, or the people lives in the county, you know, whether it's a house issue or whether they get the water or you know, whatever, you know, it's not equitable in the, in the community itself. So I thought that's a really nice come together for both parties and work for a common goal. Uh, and again, I had the, all the information passed around. And there were great key, key, no, uh, key uh, note speakers. One was Dr. Ivory Tolson. And he deconstructing the achievement gap to move from equity to excellence. And um, I mentioned that to Dr. Meyer. Maybe he will come and talk to all our teachers. Um, and and, and he, you know, he was um, dissecting the data and actually how data not necessarily shows what our kids learning, um, you know, he said so many reasons uh, the data can fail us, uh, maybe because the kids, do, you know, don't want to take the test or they don't, you know, care about um, um, the test or they didn't sleep well, that's why. So it's, you know, failing SOLs doesn't mean that, you know, kids don't know. So that was an interesting one. And then um, I attended uh, July 30th, our administrators retreat first day, I know they had a week long one, but um, I, it was a great session for me and I really impressed the session by Dr. Dyker reaching our students together. So all students, every, every day, every student, um, you know, so we have to care for each child every day. Um, so that was a really uh, good session on co-teaching. And this morning I welcome our new teachers at uh, Auburn High School, that was really nice to see a lot of smiley faces. And the biggest takeaway was so many experienced new teachers out there. I mean, there are new, new teachers, you know, stand up and I, they, they were helpful. But then they were teachers from one to three to almost all the way to 27 year experience, I think, standing up and they came to teach in, in our county. So it was, it was wonderful. So that, that's it. I think that wraps up my summer. <laughs> And if I could follow up on a few notes, sure. that you all sort of jarred my memory for the, from the summer. But um, <clears throat> first, I'd like to you know let you know I, I let you know we were having an administrative retreat last week. We had um, our, our first retreat I, probably in a while for administrators, at least since I've been here. And it was four days of, re, of, of the retreat. It went really well. Had all of our administrators there, other central office personnel, guidance counselors also um, attended some of the. Um, um, 
some of the a couple of the days but uh, the first couple of days uh, we did have Lisa Deeker who's yeah. an expert in special education from University of Central Florida and she did a wonderful job yeah. and, and, um, and, and of course that's an area that we're gonna we're gonna really focus on um, our finance department gave us some updates our human resource department gave us updates we talked about um, how we could better communicate uh, between ourselves and our schools uh, we talked about staff evaluations uh, we trained our principals on e-discipline, which is a new online discipline program. So basically this year, our teachers will not have paper that they write out their, any referrals on. It's actually an online program that will track it um, e even better. Um, one day we had lunch with law enforcement and, and mm -hmm. some folks from the Department of Education come down and, and speak with us and, and uh, Ms. Diggs and her department helped us with that. On um, last Wednesday, we had a full day of uh, threat assessment training and our our staff was trained on new threat threat assessment process and that um, basically anyone who is on a threat assessment team at the schools uh, came and attended that uh, that session it was an all-day session and uh, they went really really well um, Thursday was teaching tolerance um, wonderful uh, of course Ms. Graham was there yeah. wonderful session um, for an entire day uh, we had guidance counselors there as well along with administrators um, a lot of positive feedback and, and with uh, the teaching tolerance um, um, session and um, a lot of momentum uh, we're going to bring back um, uh, the teaching tolerance folks for a day sometime this, this school year and um, we're, we're going to have uh, you know many teachers actually the most they can do at one time is 80 I'm hoping we have 80 that teachers who will come and, and, and participate in it but I think that shouldn't should not be a problem um, this this group was recommended to to myself by two teachers from Blacksburg High School who attended their teaching tolerance conference in Raleigh earlier in the school year and I can see why they would recommend this to our school division so um, just just a uh, excellent um, excellent workshop also on that day I had the opportunity I, I, I uh, left teaching tolerance for, for about an hour and a half and I went over to Blacksburg High School our IT department did an absolutely wonderful job they did a, uh, a one-day conference on, on technology and they opened it up to other school divisions and um, there's about 150 people there participating and uh, probably uh, about I think it was about 60 from other school divisions who actually attended and, um, and I had a lot of positive feedback from our folks. Um, you know, we're one of, I think, is it Google told us, we're, we're one of the most Googly school divisions in America. <laughs> and so we showed the folks how Googly we were, and it was pretty, pretty awesome. It really was. A lot, of, a lot of great participation. Folks were really into it. So thanks to our IT department for that. So I um, okay. want to make sure I, I mention that. You. Yep. When you say googly, it reminds yeah. me of those googly eyes. That <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Thank you. I'm picturing you all with googly eyes. <laughs> googly eyes. <laughs> okay. uh, I will turn it back to okay. you, or, or shall I? Shall I? I mean, I can continue if you like with me to. The grants. Oh, but you're gonna explain the grants. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. I'll so, go through the grants. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we have <clears throat> several grants uh, this evening. <clears throat> um, first. Uh, a grant proposal structurally controlled thin film materials via solvent evaporation. That's pretty fancy. It's, yes, it is. <laughs> um, an assistant professor in the physics department of Virginia Tech has included summer internship opportunities for high school students as part of his um, uh, NS, NSF career grant application. Mm -hmm. um, and any of these grants, grants, uh, Dr. Schultz is here to answer questions about any of these grants if you have any questions. But this grant is brought to you tonight for your approval. May I have a motion to approve the grant uh, title Career Structurally Controlled Tin Film Materials via Solvent Evaporation? So moved. Second. Any discussions? I think it's great. It is great. I think yeah. it's a great opportunity. Yeah. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? We approve the grant. Okay, thank you. Um, the next is MCPS COPS SVPP School Safety Project. Uh, MCPS has partnered with the Montgomery County and the Sheriff's Office to apply for grants through the Stop uh, School Violence Act of 2018. The proposal would enhance security equipment at nine different schools. The grant would also fund a two-year part-time emergency management coordinator position within MCPS. This grant is brought to you tonight for your approval. May I have a motion to approve the grant title MCPS COPS SVPP School Safety Project? 
So moved. Second. We have motion and second. Okay. Any, any questions? Yeah. yeah. So I uh, just lost it. So what is the uh, wait a minute. You have, you have a question. It's the yeah, the, thing is right. Yeah, a couple of folks who would like to come up and talk about it because we partnered with the sheriff's department. Okay. The well, the safety court is that what it's called? Safety coordinator positions. Yes. Can we come the what exactly? Emergency management. management. Yeah. Okay. okay. So exactly, what do they do? Sure. That's come on up. Yeah. <laughs> so the grant only um, will support. It's a two-year grant. Right. Um, so we tried to write the position to help us create a comprehensive plan for Montgomery County Schools regarding safety with all of the new information and guidance and uh, suggestions that we're getting in regards to how we should be structuring safety um, within our school division. We thought it would be really nice to have somebody that could be really attentive, attentive to that piece. Mm -hmm. um, and so devising a plan, a really comprehensive plan for us and knowing that it's going to only be a two-year two position, um, one that it's, we would sustain it by it being pretty much a process. They would be creating a process for us to follow. Anything you want to add? No, I would just, you, like, you to thank, I would just like to thank Judy and uh, Dr. Schultz for their work on this because it was a cooperative um, process to get it all done in the small window that we had to, and, and there to, get, was it a small window. to get it squeezed into mm -hmm. yeah and we, we appreciate your work on this as well you know the um it, it's really I've, I've had several conversations with miss diggs about this and there are several school divisions who are hiring this position i believe roanoke city just hired mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. position yes, they do. and it, just the amount of work that judy has done in addition to her other job duties in terms of school safety it's amazing it's been very time consuming yeah. over the past six yeah. months oh, yeah. and um if we were to receive this grant to have someone who that was their job to to uh you know to to look at our schools and identify needs and and, and, and an expert you know someone you know probably through law enforcement who had law enforcement a law enforcement background yeah, yeah. to actually um to give us suggestions and to look out for our safety and you know we have to do crisis plans every year we actually you know uh, luckily we work with three great um, law enforcement offices who uh, work with our schools on their on their management plans crisis management plans and their school safety plans um, but it, it would be great to have more expertise on our side because mm -hmm. um, they, they, they have a limited number of resources and time as well so what, what, you know we'll see if we get the grant you know um so. <laughs> we hope so yeah cross some fingers so uh we will keep you updated and is this something that our safety committee would continue to look at and perhaps Absolutely. you know make a recommendation mm -hmm. or if it's something worthy of making a full-time yeah position. But absolutely and, and this is something this is what's great about a grant like this it, we could get it you know um get the process started and process, process, can, but, but, evaluate but, the value right. mm -hmm. exactly you know of the position the is, and then see if it's something that we want to we want to move forward with right. um but in, in 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 this day it's something that is in the it's front of everyone's too. minds and that's the safety mm -hmm. of our kids and schools and um it is um it, it, we spend a lot of time which we should uh making sure that um our kids are safe and we've we've gone i mean half of our training this past week um about half the time was spent mm -hmm. uh, with our safety, principals yeah. on school safety mm -hmm. and um and so that that's how much we're making it a a priority and so i just have a quick question why we don't have falling branch and margaret peaks not listed on the list of elementary schools Harvey and uh, Judy worked together to look at the list of schools where work had not been completed yet. So these okay. are the schools that don't have the okay. The so the video other cameras. two comp. Yeah, th these complete. are the ones that, that have things that are missing still know. that they're yes. adding to. Okay, I was curious. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We approve our grant. All right, thank you. The next is uh, MCPS School Security Equipment Project. This year, we're applying uh, to the state for school security equipment funds to benefit CES, CPS, and Harding Avenue. Uh, this grant is brought to you tonight for your approval. I have a motion to approve the grant title MCPS School Secu Security Equipment Project. So moved. 
Second. A motion and a second. Any discussions regarding this one, board members? Just curious, um, will this, are there other schools that are also missing this equipment that will, we would eventually want to do it to as, as well? Or are these the only schools missing this equipment? Do you know, Jonathan? It's Harvey. Or Harvey, either one? He's, he's back behind the window. Yeah. <laughs> Is he waving at me? Uh, essentially, yes. I mean, um, this would complete, uh, be between the two grants, it would complete the video cameras mm -hmm. at all the schools. It would complete the two-way radios at the elementary schools that don't have them. There are, there's another category of equipment that we're still uh, looking to add. Um, it, it escapes me as to what that other column on the spreadsheet was, but it was, a, a, it was, a, it was the intercoms. Uh, the intercom systems, and that one's a really expensive piece. This is a grant that we've actually applied for, I think, five times. We've gotten it four times, uh, three times all the way, and once partially. So we're, it's, it's just the next phase in the schools that haven't had it yet. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have the right grant. Okay, thank you. Next is the uh, VSBA Media Honor Roll recognizes fair and balanced reporting about our schools. We're, we recommend that Sam Wall and Lynch Kirchner uh, from the News Messenger be nominated for the VSBA Honor Roll. <coughs> With your approval of the attached resolution, we will submit their names to VSBA. I have a motion to approve the VSBA Media Honor Roll uh, resolution as presented. Motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussions, board members? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We approve the resolution. Okay. Okay, next. Um, Our board goals. Yes, at board <laughs> goals. At the uh, school board retreat, the board discussed its 2018-19 uh, board goals, a draft version of the goals uh, was presented for review on June 19. Uh, the change suggests at that time was incorporated and the document tonight is brought to you for your approval. May I have a motion to approve 2018-19 board goals as presented? So moved. I have a motion and a second. Any discussions? No good. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We approve our goals. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, next is policy 7-2.3, an attendance policy. This policy was revised in June. The change tonight corrects a place where the policy was not in line with itself. The word consecutive is removed before undocumented absences. The new change will be brought to you on August 21st for your approval. Um, are there any questions regarding this? simple change that we need to make yeah okay um, next um, <laughs> policy 6-2.4 animals in schools uh, this is the first reading of this policy this change this was a code change uh, in the past couple of years and our policy had not been changed to, to be in line with uh, the code uh, of Virginia this change allows teachers to bring in turtles birds and ducks <laughs> <laughs> as they relate to the educational interest of students Wild animals are still not allowed on school property. The policy will be brought to you for your approval on April 21st. August 21st. August. That sounds April. discriminatory. August 21st. <laughs> I'm sorry. August 21st. I apologize. Yes. Okay. So. Snakes are still not allowed. No. <laughs> no okay. Frogs, no frogs. So when it's they talked, they talked about uh, you know allergies and things in here. Mm -hmm. So that we still have students who. So what happens if we have a child who is in a classroom? I know it says the animal will be removed and not the student, you know, if they're a pet in the classroom all year. Just, I don't know, it just kind of sounds discriminatory, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. No big issue, just a question. Okay. But you're not talking about cats and dogs, you're talking about like Science, like yeah, learning. Like turtles and, right, yeah. but we have dogs in our school now, schools yeah, now, therapy, yeah. therapy dogs, mm -hmm. and we have kids in those same schools who have. If I understand, moves. this is specifically wild animals, and now these these three classifications of wild animals are now allowed. So turtles, yeah, birds, wild and ducks. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but other wild animals are not allowed. 
So. Correct. Gotcha. You can't bring the coyote to, to, <laughs> to school. Not even to CES. Okay. Right. <laughs> So that means the lizards can't come in. Yeah, the lizards can't come in. Either. No kangaroos. Doctor, man, please feel to address. If history serves, at one time in the state of Virginia, turtles were specifically targeted not to be right, into because, schools yeah. because they were carrying disease. Yeah. Right. A disease. Now, in yeah. talking to Patty G, who's not here tonight, that's no longer the concern that it was at one time. So they're being allowed. Th thus, yeah. the reason to the not, not yeah. discriminate against those particular. <laughs> <laughs> and your allergies is a good question. We do go through, check with school nurses, that type mm -hmm. of thing. If somebody has an allergy, then for instance, one year we kept a dog on one side of the school because there was a child with an allergy. So we do look at that. And of course the child takes precedence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, next, um, Mr. Pauly. Six dash four. Right? <laughs> yes, we'd like to come up because uh, he'll be up for the next couple of policies and one short presentation. One, um, policy six dash four point three graduation requirements. This is the first reading of this policy. Uh, the changes reflect changes of the Virginia Assessment Program, formerly known as the SOLs. Um, seems like they've changed that language. Yeah, that's um, to be more inclusive to be, because yeah. it's not just going to be SOL tests, but other forms of assessment right. as well. Uh, the, the policy is, is also updated to say that the graduation requirements in effect when a student enters the ninth grade govern that student's graduation when they enter the ninth grade. This provides more simplicity in the policy and the board approved program of studies clearly delineate, delineates the difference in the graduation requirements. It'll be brought to you on August uh, 21st uh, for your approval. Um, any questions or, that you have or, uh, or Mr. Pauly, anything that you wanted to talk about in this change? So all the details that we put prior, right. um, are they gonna be on the handbook? You know, is that a handbook information? Yeah, still be in the program of study. So all those okay, charts. program of study, yeah. So there are now four charts mm -hmm. because there's standard diploma and advanced studies diploma. If you've entered uh, in ninth grade 2013, 14 to 2017, yeah. 18, and then a chart for each diploma mm -hmm. type for if you enter 2018, 19 and beyond. Yeah. So eventually, three years from now, there theoretically would be only two charts. Be, yeah. So. And it they kind can't of would, pull the rug out from under you once your graduation requirements have been established. Supposed to be that way, yes, ma'am. Supposed to be able to change them on you. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. Let me say one big change um, that I think needs to be noted is that it, it, for this current um, rising ninth grade class, um, they will be required to pass one. I'll just use the word SOL test um, to receive a verified credit. Um, in each subject area um, while in high school. And, um, you know, and so what, what's, what may happen, and this is not may, but it's probably going to happen, for instance, this year a ninth grader passes, for instance, a world history test. Once they pass that test, they do not have to take any more social studies test, which is nice, okay? Yeah, that's nice, yeah. You know, you pass one, so we're eliminating tests for students. Yeah. Okay. However, Students didn't get to 11th grade. They take U.S. history. The ones who took the world history test and passed it do not have to take it. Yeah, and it's not even just that you don't have to take it. You can't. They told you us we will not test them. We're not allowed to get We're not allowed to test. to test them. Once they've met their verified credit requirement, mm -hmm. we cannot test them. So what will happen is you'll have students in 11th grade who have not passed the test before now taking it. So um, the prediction will be our scores will go down. You'll see possibly a U.S. pass rate going from 85 to possibly 50 percent all in one year. Um, that could possibly happen, you know, um, because a lot of times kids who fail tests, you know, they'll continue to do so, unfortunately. And so that may, that may cause a dip in some of our high school scores. Um, and some tests we anticipate never giving again, like chemistry, the chemistry SOL test, mm -hmm. those students likely passed the biology and or earth science SOL test, so they will not take it. That's a big and those used to boost good. those used to boost school scores because yeah. you would get nearly a hundred percent pass yeah. on right. chemistry. So I'm glad that we're, the state has eliminated tests. Yes. I think it's right. great for kids. I, right. I really do. And 
and um, well, give them some other options. Hopefully, op when they were assessing us, you know, they will yeah, they recognize differently the situation when, you know, they've can they re you know, hopefully they will recognize that, all right? That is well, you know, th there is a happen. there is a new assessment system as well that we will uh, we will talk about at some yeah. point and, and educate you on. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's a little different than it's a lot different than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in fact, the the new the new accreditation system will look more like the old federal system, where there are um, there are gap groups. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so the state has not done that before. And so, um, you know, it, they've pretty much adopted the gap groups of the federal government that, that schools will be held accountable for those groups, which I'm glad of. I'm fine with that. You know, we need to teach all kids, and I truly believe that. Yeah. So, uh, um, so yeah, yeah. But we'll, we'll give you that presentation yeah, sometime soon. Education. Once we figure it out. Once we figure everything <laughs> yes. out. Once the state yeah, figures they decide it out, first. and then we yeah. figure it out. Right. There are actually questions that the, that the DOE is can't answer for us yeah. um, now and uh, in fact some things they're saying to us are different than things they actually have in writing right and so that's sort of frustrating to mr. Polly <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's I like things with you writing, know. writing this uh, writing the policies for us and making sure it's in line and so um, but we'll we'll keep working through it you know uh, interesting the, the federal government requires that we that our kids take one math test in high school Right. And a, a question they cannot answer. We have kids who start, there are only three math tests. There's algebra one, mm -hmm. geometry, and algebra two. Yeah. So we have kids who take algebra one in sixth grade. They're, they're done in middle seven, school. They're done all in middle school with all their That's SOL math <laughs> tested math. Yeah. Right. So does that count? So, but they don't know. But they don't they don't know. Yeah, but they're so saying that they no will test. allow a substitute test like an AP test, assuming those will be the students that take AP. Yeah. Right. But they've already taken the test. I, I Why know. can't yeah. it count? They'll they'll figure it out. <laughs> so ask yeah, the cumulative. That's a good problem to have. Yeah. It's a yeah, great yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. So that's the that's the that's the Washington. Yeah, the logic doesn't do. work sometimes. <laughs> yeah, unless the student who's already taken all those tests and mm -hmm. now I've got to take another one. Yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> and they do have to take biology. I learned that fairly recently that all high school students will take the biology SOL test. Mm -hmm. They do not that, necessarily have to pass it. Um, at least take it. I think that's for federal accountability. It. They have they to do the biology. Take it. Yeah. Right. They do not have to pass it if they have passed the earth science. It is, so we're still dealing with well, that's right. Yeah, what you said right. sets of rules that we were hoping to eliminate. And, and, and the Virginia Department of Education was trying to do that as well. Yeah, there's two sets of rules that are written, and then there's what they're saying. So there's kind of like three sets. Yeah. Okay. Questions? I think they're clear good. So this is a first reading for that Correct. policy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll yeah. go home and read it now. <laughs> yeah, we'll come back on the 20, uh, 21st for yeah. approval. You know, we've, uh, we've run the policies, you know, past our attorney. Um, the policies are written um, from my understanding that it's not by choice. It's, it's, it is, the, we've, we've kept them in line with the regulations as, as we know them. The next policy is um, there is some choice. Uh, the 6-6.2 student evaluation and grading. This is the first reading of this policy. Uh, the changes allow for the final assessment to occur through a variety of methods. And this will also be brought to you for approval on the 21st. And Mr. Pauley has some survey results from the final, this is going back to the final exam pilot. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has some results to share with you, Mr. Pauley. I do. So as you remember, two years ago, we piloted this uh, simply at Auburn High School or exclusively mm -hmm. at Auburn High School. It went very well, so we extended the pilot to all four high schools, and then we created, uh, the principals and I created a survey for uh, teachers, and then a separate one for parents and students uh, to see how everyone uh, thought it went. It was a rather extensive survey. We asked a lot of questions about what went right with it, what went wrong with it, what can be fixed, um, people's opinions. But um, the data that I wanted to share with you this evening was at the end of the day, how did people feel about moving forward with turning this into a policy? And so for teachers, we got 197 respondents, uh, which was good representation at the end of the year. This was done in May. Uh, and you could see it's distributed the way you would think it would be, um, with the bigger schools having more teachers than the smaller schools. And so what did the teachers say? Um, the first was an opinion question, like overall, which uh, of the following expresses your opinion of the uh, process? 
and they had a choice of either I liked having students only being required to attend school for SOL testing and remediation, or I would prefer having students required to attend school every day. And you can see that's over 94% of the teachers liked the way we did it. And then the $64 million question was, so would you like to continue with this practice moving it into policy? And over 92% of the teachers said yes, they would. I would like to note that of the rather small percentage of folks who said no, uh, I was able to break it down and look at it by school and by grade level and what they taught. Actually, a lot of those people who said no, and even a fair number who said yes, had very many good suggestions to improve it. Most of those suggestions have to do with really logistics and um, communication, people not really fully understanding how it worked. But philosophically, uh, it was very, very strong um, approval from everyone. So then we did the same with parents and students. So it was uh, after school let out and sent it home to parents and asked them to sit down with their children and talk about their opinions uh, and their experiences. Some of it was rather uh, entertaining <laughs> because several parents said, well, I feel this way and my student feels this way, so I'll put what my student thinks since they're the student was probably <laughs> the, uh, the most popular. Uh, but still a fair, uh, fairly good representation with 336 respondents. And again, over 92% said that they liked the system of coming to school and setting aside days exclusively for SOL testing and remediation that seemed to work very well. Uh, again, with a few logistical scheduling type things, but we're going to tweak that. And uh, then asking again the big question, would you like to see us continue this and move it into policy? And over 91% said yes, they would. So uh, we feel like that is good uh, enough to propose to you that we change the policies. I have to be honest and say that I actually rewrote this policy two years ago in anticipation of this day um, <laughs> and <laughs> in hopes. And so if you read through it, you would really see a huge section of policy completely eliminated because a lot of it was about SOL waiver policy um, and final exam exemption policy and the confusion that that caused, all of that's gone. Um, even changed a lot of the language as far as if you're at a traditional scheduled school or a block scheduled school because really all four of them are hybrid scheduled schools now who have both types of courses. So some of that language has been cleaned up and I think made simpler to read. Uh, and we took the opportunity to fix a few other things, but most part, you'll notice it's the language right out of the presentations that were made to you, cut right from the presentation into the policy, uh, and then looked at and vetted through the attorney and turned back to us with approval. So we are seeking your approval in two weeks. And I'm here for questions. Any questions, board members? I just want to say thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to say for thank you. For being the catalyst that moved so us there. A lot of work also. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next is um, policy 5 2.1. Uh, it's the first reading of this policy. This policy is updated to say the job openings will be posted for a minimum of seven days, changing it from a minimum of 14. And Ms. Whitaker is here to answer any questions. If you have questions, still. Why? Why? <laughs> Thoughts? Go, oh, go ahead. Yeah, um, the, the recommendation for this policy change is really to help us with our staffing. Um, you know, it says 14 days and it says unless in an emergency. So those emergency situations do arise uh, pretty often. You know, if someone leaves a position and then we have to post for 14 days, they, we only have to get two weeks notice. So then we have a gap in time where we don't have an employee. So it would help us in our staffing. We could, of course, leave it open as long as we chose to. Uh, but it would help us to make sure that we're filling positions and that our, all of our departments are having the staff in place that they need. Any questions? I, I'm just not necessarily, don't think I agree with it. I think um, 14 days gives more folks to be, have time to look at it, to make up their minds about it. Seven days can go really quick. Uh, before people even hear about the opening. So I'm going to be voting no.
I guess my concern too would be would we get as good of a pool at seven days? And I realize you can't extend it. If you sure. look at it and go, you know, no one's applied or it. only one person has applied, you know, you can extend it. But you know, typically what we work to do is we, we want to find the best folks. So when we know in advance that we're going to have a posting, say someone tells us I'll, I'll be re retiring this year or I'll be leaving, we certainly do everything we can to leave it up for a very long period of time so that we can get the folks that we need to. Um, this is more, you know, applies to situations where, again, you know, someone says I'm leaving and I'm leaving in two weeks. And then we have the the two-week posting, the interview process, the board process, and so we have, you know, two or three weeks with somebody, an open position that, that nobody would be in. When we know in advance, it's really easy to post it for a long time, but when someone says two weeks, it makes it a lot harder for us, and then we have to try to find substitutes to fill those positions, and, and that's very difficult in a lot of our support staff jobs. So this is really um, a rare rarity. I mean, an emergency type of thing. So for right now, it's more common, yeah. you know, in, in this situation is it more right now. In support staff? Is that it is more saying? common in support staff because, again, they only have to give a two weeks' notice. With the other employees, you know, that are under contract, they're under contract and we have to release them from contract. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it is more common with our support staff, or say someone just has a really big emergency, maybe they're under contract, but we, we go ahead and let them go because they need to be wherever that, you know, that emergency is. Right now, it is um, a definite need, and so what we do at this point is we determine it is an emergency. You know, someone has said, we plan for them to be there, and then they call us today and say, oh, I'm, I'm not coming back. Then we, and that happens right now all the time, then we certainly consider that an emergency and we shorten the posting period so that we can make sure that we have staff in place when school starts. That can make a hard load on whoever's left. It does, because, right. you know, again, it's, we have a hard, I agree. Let's, let's talk about custodians. We have a very hard time hiring custodians, and we work constantly to get subs in. And most of our subs become long-term employees, but it's very difficult. And then that workload is put on someone else for two or three weeks and maybe taken from another school to put into another school. Yeah. Um, and I you know. do hear that a lot about okay, how hard I, it I is on the, the people so that we, are in there. So mm -hmm. we need to look at how we compensate our employees, and maybe we wouldn't have these problems. <laughs> Any other questions? I think it, as long as you have the flexibility, if, if you're not satisfied with the pool, to be able to ex yeah. extend as long as needed to get the right person, right. it's probably again, it's, no need it's to trusting HR to be professionals yeah. and, and mm -hmm. handle it. Well, and we want, you know, we want the best employee. We want to recruit and retain. We don't want to keep filling positions. So we certainly want to accept as many applications as we can and review them so that we are interviewing the best candidates. Off the top of your head, do you remember how many um, hires we made in HR last year? <laughs> Probably 350, 380, something like that the year before, maybe even close to 400. The year before was over 452. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was between four and 500 and mm -hmm. 365 days, not that many work days. Yeah. I mean, they're continuously, and it's mostly classified staff, that's a continuous mm -hmm. turnover. And you're right, compensation would hold, yeah. keep people around. Yeah. Yep. There's no yeah, doubt. Absolutely. Yeah. And so we'll continue yeah, to work on that in the next that. budget as well. So yeah. I agree 100%. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, you know, one of the things that I have learned throughout my life is people change so you need to make sure your policies are going to hold clear to what you really want and not sure. just depend on people <laughs> sorry <laughs> i've learned hard way mm -hmm. okay thank you thank you okay. <clears throat> um next um recogniz recognition let's see of uh, student academic achievement policy uh, 6-6.3 was revised in June. The change presented tonight corrects a place where the policy was not in line with itself. The number of decimal points mm -hmm. that will be calculated for a student's grade point average should be two in all places. We found that it was not. Uh, we'll bring this back to you for approval on August 21st. Mm -hmm. Any questions about that? policy our policies were not consistent with itself yeah. um, and, and to let you know uh, our folks are going through uh, an extensive policy review 
at this point, <laughs> looking at policies yeah. That's a good thing. very closely, <laughs> yeah. which uh, we found had, had not been done for a while. And mm -hmm. we're trying to correct things, get, get it right, and make it consistent. And um, these are things that, that's, that um, are being caught. So you'll, we'll have a few of these coming, coming back to us <laughs> as, we, as we continue to catch, uh, um, I don't know if you call it mistakes, but just inconsistencies, you know? So, okay. Um, next, uh, Ms. Dix is here tonight to present an update on attendance uh, from the last uh, two school years. Ms. Dix. Good evening. So tonight I want to share with you um, our most current outcomes and progress regarding the attendance for Montgomery County Schools. Uh, for the past several years, our school division has focused on developing a framework to motivate high attendance expectations for all students and to provide support for those students who have more intense needs. Uh, we've aligned our process with our six-year plan, and we've used um, our tiered systems of support in terms of using positive behavior interventions and supports at all levels for all of our students. So tonight, I'm going to be reviewing some of our data points in regards to attendance for Montgomery County Schools, and I'm going to present it uh, using a couple of perspectives as we look at this data. So in this uh, first slide, the chart uh, compares our average daily attendance uh, percentages or the um, attendance rate for the 16, 17, and 17, 18 school years. Now the average daily attendance is the number of students who are sh showing up um, every day. So in this graph, you can see that we've broken it down into division percentages, and then we've uh, disaggregated that even a little further by looking at elementary schools, our middle schools, and our high schools for the two different school years. Um, and in this graph, the percentage of students who were absent, it looks at the percentage of students who are absent for less than 10%, or 18 days or less for each of the school years uh, represented. So overall, for the division, for the 16-17 school year, you can see that our um, percentage rate was at 95.3% for our students who were absent 18 days or less, or they missed less than 10% of the school year. Um, in comparison to the 17-18 school year, where it was 94.9% of our students who missed 18 days or less. And in comparison to the state um, average for that year, it was 95.1. So you can see we're um, right, uh, pretty much where we sh should be in re comparison to the state data. Our elementary school students um, were attending school at 95.5% or, uh, or better, as well as our uh, middle school students. But you can see our high school students, um, that rate is slightly below at 94% and 93% respectively. Um, in regards to the school years. And so in this next slide, this chart is displaying, again, the average daily attendance, but in a little bit of a different format. It's showing the percentage of students who missed a specific range of days during the school year. And so at the bottom there, you can see that we're looking um, at uh, the number of students who missed between 0 and 10%, and then from 10 to 15%. 15 to 20% and then more than 20%. Um, and this data is broken down. This is basically the way that you would see it on the state report card. And for the 16, 17 school year, um, you can see that um, um, the blue is representing the, the largest number of uh, students uh, who miss between zero and 10% or zero to 18 days of school and that's 89% of our students that fell in that range. So the majority of our students are missing 18 days or, late, or, or less. The red uh, piece of the pie uh, shows the students that would have missed 10 to 15% of days. Um, that equals 18 to 27 days, and 5.5% of our students missed that number of days, and that would equal about 500 students. Uh, the green piece of the, the pie um, looks at the students that missed 27 to 36 days. That's 2% of our students, or roughly 200 students. And then the last piece of the pie that you see there is the students that missed more than 36 days. 
That's 3% of our students for the 16-17 school year, and that's roughly 280 students. Um, the state average um, for missing uh, between the 0 and 10% was 87.8%. So again, we fell um, a little bit above that range. And the, the state range was 6.4%, was um, representing the red piece of the pie, um, um, which looks at the number of students that missed um, 18 to 27 days. So if you go back to the previous slide, I'm not going to do that. Um, and we look at the average daily attendance, which was, uh, the range was like 95.3%, and the pie that represents the blue and part of the red. And so they, they equal about the same. So I've just actually just tried to give you a different way of looking at that data. So the next slide looks at our unexcused absences. Um, and I chose to show you this because this is really how we account for the absences for our students. Um, and not only the way that we account for the absences, but the way that we have to respond to the absences based on state requirements. And so our policy, as well as state requirements, uh, recommend that we look at five uh, plus absences, six plus and seven plus absences. Um, and we are looking at those because we're also to respond to those absences um, and responding to those absences by calling parents, by making sure that we're engaging with families, that we're um, putting them on notice or recognizing the fact that those students are missing school. We also, at the six and seven absences, put specific interventions in place, and that's when we start writing attendance plans. So I thought it was important for you, you all to see this information as well. So you can see in the 2016-17 school year, um, um, I'm going to talk more about the percentages. You can see that if you look across there, um, at five plus absences, 25% of our students were missing school. At six plus absences, that drops to 21%. And at seven plus absences, it just drops to 17%. Um, in that school year, we were implementing attendance plans, um, and most of that work was being implemented by our social workers or our student adventure coordinators. Um, and you can see it was making um, somewhat of a difference in students um, engaging with those families, making them aware of the importance of their students being in school, and um, it was making a difference in terms of those students then starting to, to show back up. In the 2017-18 school year, again, you can see that there is a, a decline um, in the percentages of students that are missing from five plus absences up to seven plus absences. Um, it's a little bit um, more significant in terms of the, the drop in the number of students um, who were not missing school at that seven plus absences. This past school year, we also incorporated at the five plus absences um, having more school personnel engage with their own students uh, in regards to absences. Um, we felt like it was, and based on some of the ESSA guidance, that it was important to make sure that the schools themselves were connecting with those students and not just the social workers. So we incorporated that, and I do believe that it has made somewhat of a difference if you look across um, the 2017-18 uh, data points. And you're calling these unexcused absences? These are unexcused as absences. As opposed to what was in the very first chart, which is just total absences, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, the other thing that you will notice here is um, you know, there's a significant difference in the percentage points between the number of students who were missing seven plus absences um, from the 16-17 school year to the number of students who were missing seven plus absences in the 17-18 school year. So we're, we're hoping we're on the right path in terms of trying to address um, the absences in the school. Is there, is there any way we can get uh, feedback from s some of these students as far as the impact of having their school actually engaging with them too, maybe to make them feel like they're care about that, that I think that's a really good idea and, and we certainly will um, do that and later on in the, the my presentation you're going to see because we felt like I mean what we did this year we certainly incorporated some more school staffs doing that but 
this year we, we need we know we need to even dive a little bit deeper it, it can't it can't just be one or two people this is not we're not going to make much progress if we're not involving and incorporating as many people as possible and connecting to those students making those students um, know that they're welcome that they're mm -hmm. missed when they're not in school um, so we we definitely plan to in, engage more um, or get more um, team involvement from at the school level um, to make that happen. Um, and we are looking at ways to collect that, the, the data around that as well. I know Ms. Diggs and her folks are restructuring how they're covering schools this coming year as well to get more focused attention at each school. Yeah. Um, but you know, definitely a, a tremendous improvement on un, in, in terms of unexcused absences. And something to note too, while we're talking about it, is the new state accountability, that's a new piece. They actually will, uh, we're, that is that is a point that we're accredited by is student attendance. Mm -hmm. If we drop below a certain um, level, we will not be accredited. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I've mentioned that to teachers in schools, of course, it's, you know, it can be disheartening in terms of, you know, school, we're being held accountable for folks. For parents not getting parents kids not to sending school. kids to school yeah. at times, right. Exactly. But I mean, but then too, my response is that there are things we can do to make kids want to be there. Yeah. Come to school right. and make yeah. them an invited that's place. Good, that's mm -hmm. And that's what we're working on. And yeah. I think exactly. we're doing a great job. You know, you look at the first couple of slides where our attendance dropped is, it, I think the bar graph makes it look, look it's only like a half percent. It is. Between, it's not yeah, significant. It's a half percent means. difference between yeah. exactly. um, for the, all absences. Yes. And um, if I had to guess this year, um, the, we had a ton of absence because of the flu. Yeah. We had, the, you gotta remember the flu was really bad this year. I mean, my house alone accounted for several days, I mean, that would not have happened. And so we were telling kids to stay home. So that may have dropped that, but, uh, but the unex so an excused absence would be if you're sick, obviously. Exactly. Yeah, and so, uh, but the unexcused absences, there's no accountability there. It dropped four percent. Mm -hmm. That's pretty amazing. I'm mm -hmm. thinking so. I think so too. The Diggs and her folks are doing a great job. So um, this next slide just digs a little bit deeper into the data at the five, six, and seven absences. And so what I did was I just broke it down so you can see how it looks at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. Um, and it, again, as you kind of would expect, um, it looks the data looks better for our elementary age students. Um, you know, by the time the kids get to high school, we see more truancy because they're they're not. Um, they're being absent because they want to be absent. It's not because parents are giving them permission to. And so you, that's just a, one of those data points that we know we have to uh, look more closely at. And we're um, being really intentional about making sure that we do that. And so the, the last slide, I wanted to share this with you because as Dr. Meyer just mentioned, um, um, we're gonna, the, the way that we're gonna be measuring attendance is going to change um, beginning this school year. Um, so in the past, we've measured the attendance of students by looking at unexcused absences. Um, and the focus has really been on truancy or those students who have missed school without permission. But beginning this school year, because of revisions made by ESSA, we, we will be measuring attendance by looking at chronic absenteeism. And that's defined as those students who miss 10% or more of the school year, regardless of the reason. And so it's going to change from us not just looking at excused absences, but excused and unexcused. They will all be counted. And like Dr. Meyer just said, in, in addition, Virginia has included the attendance rates as a quality indicator for accreditation. So I included this, this slide, and this slide is from this past school year. Um, and I just want to let you know that the data that is reported in this slide is unofficial data. It's not data that's collected to send in to the Department of Education because they're not collecting it yet. Uh, so it's been locally tabulated. But um, best that we can tell, um, we are still, um, I mean, it, it's not, overall, the, the data looks good in terms of being under that 10% margin uh, that we're going to have to reach for all students. At the elementary level, you can see it's uh, right at 7%. Um, middle and the middle school, it's, again, um, hovering around the 10% margin. Of course, the high school level is a little higher, and that is an area of, of concentration for us for the school year. Um, and then I decided to disaggregate it by our, our communities, our school communities. Um, and again, you can see that Auburn and Christiansburg are hovering right at that 10% uh, level. Uh, Blacksburg is at 6%, um, but our Eastern Montgomery community is at 17%. So again, that's an area that we know. It's, ha it's, 
it's been an area that that's been a focus for us anyway for quite some time so we know that those are going to be the areas that we really need to pay close attention to that we're going to have to put more services um, uh, and intervention strategies in place for uh, for this following school year and so some of the ways that we've already done that uh, listed some of our accomplishments one of the ways that we have managed our truancy you may remember me a couple of years ago um, in talking about our attendance, talking about our uh, family resource team, and it was piloted. And it's basically the brainchild of our court services um, because we had a lot of students who were coming before uh, the judge uh, for truancy. Um, and, you know, the typical uh, consequence for that has been um, uh, fining parents or um, sometimes the students were placed in detention. And that hasn't always been effective because you just ended up with repeat offenders. Um, and so they um, decided that if, we, if it would be possible to create a multidisciplinary team approach around providing supports for those students. And so we have that in our school. We piloted in the East the Montgomery Strand at Eastern Montgomery, um, or, um, the high school as well as the middle school. Um, then last year, we moved it to all of our secondary schools, so we had team meetings um, for all of our um, secondary uh, schools, and this year, for the first time, we included our, some of our elementary schools. Not all of them, but some of them. And you can see here that we staffed um, about 145 students just in family resource team in those family resource team meetings. And so what this has done is it's reduced the number of students who also need court intervention. And so that's been a really positive thing. The other thing that we had in place is that we have a truancy officer, and so when we do take kids um, to court, we have a more consistent and a concise um, process for taking those students to court. We have one person that's really, um, you know, operating those those meetings and and facilitating those meetings on our behalf at, um, with court services, and so it's just created a more streamlined and consistent way that we're looking at that information. And uh, that person is also very much involved in all of those family resource team meetings. Uh, the other thing is uh, we um, have created, you know, the tiered responses to student absences, and we're really focusing on educating and engaging our students and families and trying to be more involved um, uh, with the, the school staff members, inc including them in the process. Um, and so in moving forward, in terms of looking at our future work, we're, we're excited this year. Uh, Dr. Meyer mentioned e-discipline. Another part of e-discipline is going to be um, a um, early warning system that's connected to e-discipline. And so each of our schools will be able to look at their own uh, snapshot of all of their student information, not just uh, discipline, but um, their academics as well as their attendance. Um, and so they will be able to, to better monitor and manage um, what kinds of supports are needed for their, their students in their schools. And their, our principals are really excited about that, so we are too. We're just hoping that having all of that data in front of us will help us make better um, decision making. Um, processes in play, place for our students. As he also mentioned, we also restructured our student services office because if, to manage this, it means that we need to be more attentive and, and using our staff in a smarter way. So rather than parceling uh, people out, we've just pulled everybody together um, and they are, will be supporting our schools. They have less schools that they will have to support um, so that we can really be a support to them as we're really trying to to build this, this um, system of in, engagement and meeting the needs of our students, as well as their families. Um, and lastly, the biggest thing that we'll be doing is just providing more preventive and proactive measures as we're looking at um, the attendance in our schools. It's, we're, we're being really creative. Um, my team has worked really, really hard since we only made this decision back in well, when ESSA, the, the guidance came out, that was back in the spring, and we knew we had to do something different, but uh, we've worked really, really hard, and we've got a really solid process in place, and we're just hoping that it's going to make even a bigger difference um, at the end of this school year. Yeah, and something Sticks talked about is using, using their people more wisely. Um, you know, what we had were attendance teams, and then we had behavior teams. Yeah. Well, it, they were the same kids ending up 
being talked about in two separate teams. Yes. And so what's happened, so we, we got this group talking about the same kid mm -hmm. as this other group. So we've spread the resources so it all becomes one because usually attendance become, you know, there are issues yeah, with behavior, yeah. um, you know, um, actual academic issues mm -hmm. and mental health. Yeah. Correct. And so we have folks at the table who can help address all of that at yes. one time. So we're looking at so. the whole child. The whole notion is to look at the whole child. Usually attendance is a symptom of something larger. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're just trying to be more proactive in looking at the whole child, getting um, all of our school personnel to, to um, be part of that commitment and that teamwork and making sure that that happens. I know this is a different type of attendance thing, but is, do tardies still count? So many tardies as an attendance loss? So I will just tell you that the data that's reported here is whole day attendance, and that's what, that's what we're evaluating here, more so than tardies. Right, I understand, um, but it used to be- enough, That so many tardies so would many equal an absence. So many tardies as an absence, that's right. And you know, I, I know that was one of the things when uh, Dr. Sears was here and he had the you know, the tardy, the tardy kind of the sweep. I'm, yeah. I'm telling you, I still believe every high school needs to have that. As you sit out in the parking lot and see all of them come in with their Starbucks and their Sonics mm -hmm. and their this and their that. <laughs> if you want the seriousness of attendance, you got to get serious about that kind of stuff. Too. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. So yeah. I'm a huge. I so think part I of what we data to you all last year. Last year, we cut our tardies in half yes. yeah. last year because what we required our schools to do is actually there's a consequence. And that would be uh, Saturday school. Mm -hmm. Kids would have to come on Saturdays mm -hmm. or um, some type of after school detentions to make up the time when they. And so we actually, we cut them like in half, I we believe, did. last year. And I haven't seen did. the haven't seen the data for this year for yeah, in I terms looked of at tardies, tardies. But mm -hmm. yeah, two years ago, it was amazing the number of kids that were showing oh, up late to yeah. school. Yeah, crazy. And um, yeah, and, 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 and you know, we have made a huge improvement in terms of kids not showing up late because there's a consequence for showing right. up late. Right. And so, therefore, if there's a consequence for it, the uh, kids <laughs> seem to show up on time, <laughs> um, no matter how fast. Uh, sometimes they're trying to hit to the parking lot because I had one come <laughs> past me real fast <laughs> on Price's Fork one day. I had to follow him in the parking lot and ask him to drive a little safer but he said <laughs> but his words were I do not want Saturday school if I'm late one more time I've got to go to Saturday school so in a way we were doing a job <laughs> as a, there as well <laughs> so, but, but yeah we worked hard on that too yeah <laughs> other questions thank you Ms. Diggs for okay, all you do you. I know it's a lot of work thanks yeah we're making difference okay thank you exciting. absolutely Okay, hey, Mr. Kranz uh, is up next, and he has the next three items. I'll let him move right through. First are <laughs> updates on um, Falling Branch and CHS athletic uh, uh, field update, uh, and then carryover funds request, and then um, a, a, a change in the uh, HSA. And so, uh, Mr. Kranz, if you have time. Well, good evening. I'll try to go quickly. Um, first off, with Christianburg High School, um, on phase one, which is in synthet the synthetic turf that is in place. Um, they'll actually play their first scrimmage game this Friday night, um, and then a benefit game is scheduled on um, a week from Friday night. Yeah, and sorry to disrupt you, but it's a great time to re remind everyone is invited mm -hmm. on August 17th. Uh, be there by 6:45. Uh, board supervisor, school board will be recognized. We'll do a special phone call to the field to to. Um, to remember the occasion and the opening of that uh, beautiful facility um, there. So folks are really excited about that. This Friday, it's actually a scrimmage, scrimmage. game. Mm -hmm. They're scrimmaging Auburn. Auburn, that's what I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, at 6 o'clock. Um, so um, anyway, I'm sure a lot, a lot of folks will be interested in town to, to actually be at that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so anyway, I'm sorry, Mr. Krantz. Uh, no problem. Okay. The rubberized track, we've got all the asphalt down. We needed to put two layers down. Once the second layer is down, there's a cure period of 28 days. So we're in that window. Um, we probably will not get that installed until either the last week in August, which will be after the first official game on August 24th, or during the first week in September, okay? And there's just nothing we can do about that. Because of that, um, the fencing is not gonna be complete when we open. So you'll see orange fencing in place because the poles are there for the fencing, but we can't complete the fencing until we've completed the track first. They're just steps we've got to take or we're going to have problems at a later date. Um, you will see additional fencing has taken place. Um, we've done, we've 
and, and that happens with any project, particularly one this large, that things will come up that you didn't address during your initial budgetary process. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into the carryover. So we're going to be spending some additional funds addressing some of the fencing issues, particularly around a ticket booth. Um, you'll see that we're going to do some fencing issues uh, in front facing the pond, the retention pond, but we won't do as much permanent because that gets impacted by phase three. So it doesn't make sense to do stuff permanently and then it, whatever we finalize phase three and then have to come back and take that fencing out. So it's more of a temporary uh, to give it the feel, the look, uh, with the intent that we're going to be doing phase three, but it'll be at a later date than we are now. You also see some additional seamount work um, to address like the log jam that's created at the pass gate and the ticket booth. Um, ideally, the thing would be to probably redesign that whole front. Um, because of monetary considerations and the desire to get this, the project completed, um, that's not something we're addressing today, but there are some steps we can do to help minimize it. So for example, at the pass gate, rather than the pass gate interfering or, or co-mingling with the ticket booth, now we can put them through the gate, the fence, on their own separate entryway. And so that's the way we keep that crowd moving within that side. So you'll see some seamount work will be done going from the, the pass gate down to the track or to the, the walk area. You'll also see some, some cement work that needs to be completed if you were out there now that's going to go from the, the cement area basically as I come in to the entryway to the visitor side of, of the stadium. Phase two, we have started. Um, it has a completion date of February 1st. Phase two is the girls' softball field. That's the biggest part of that particular project. Um, it also has some work on baseball, and it has some additional work just around the whole complex. Um, the site work, if you've not had a chance to be out there, it is, it is a large construction zone now. Um, so if you drive out there, if you walk it between the tennis court and the gymnasium, you'll see fencing. It's construction fencing. Um, there's not much we can do about it. If, you know, in order for us to do the work we need to do and minimize the liability to the district, it, it has now become, that area has become a construction zone. But I have to say that the school seems excited about it. Um, I know their administration is extremely excited about it. And I know the district's administration is excited to get it going on that work. We also uh, will be working on walkways as we start the construction. We have to make sure that we continue to have ingress and egress for fire. We have to be in still compliance with the regulations there, and there's some doors on that side. Um, but we'll be doing, uh, as part of our overall walkway project, which you'll see new walkways from the parking lot to the softball field as well as to the baseball field. So the main point of entryway now for both softball and baseball after we've completed this will be from the student parking lot. It won't be from that back lot. Mm -hmm. It'll only be coming from the student parking lot, okay? You'll see the synthetic turf going down for the girls' softball field, uh, the dugouts, and then the concession stand and the restrooms, and those are all starting. So they have commenced, okay? And there's a lot of work that we gotta get done. The biggest one is site. On the concessions, where is it? I know we had talked about it when I walked up there. We've got it closer to where you and I talked about. It's not gonna connect because um, that door number 10 mm -hmm is a main ingress and egress point mm -hmm. and that's something that we, we want to stay cognizant of right and this will give them where um, if they actually have an overflow crowd this will put where it's located at that you could use the gym sure. right through that door as your as your overflow mm -hmm. and it wouldn't be where you know you have to have two groups of team, parents working as teams because one's way over here and one's here now you've got them close enough that you can work as one gotcha Okay. okay. And it's restrooms, so, plural, right? Yes, ma'am. Not just one restroom. Yeah, no, no, ma'am. It's it's <laughs> both men and women. That happen there. <laughs> Two, right? Uh. Ma'am, no, ma'am. It's restrooms. So I'm gonna count them, them okay? <laughs> ma'am, they'll have to be. They'll be in compliance with the code. <laughs> so one of the concerns with the concessions from the softball and the baseball folks mm -hmm. were to be able to see their children play yeah. while they're working concessions. Yeah. 
you, got you, to you will be able to see softball, baseball, you'll see some of it. You won't, it it's not where our softball and baseball fields are aligned. Mm -hmm. And with the slope that we have between softball to baseball, there's actually no one place that you can easily put that and still see, you know, if I'm a parent yeah. working it. But you can see from where we're locating it at, you'll see softball and you'll see the majority of baseball. Okay. You will I'm be able to see. I'm pretty sure, because I, I, I looked at that, because the, the stands were, were on the bank for baseball and, and the, it, we, we actually, I knew how important that was. I, I think we can see all of it. It's going to be real close. I mean, well, it depends on where we put our restrooms. It depends. Yeah. If we put the restrooms toward the parking lot, you'll get a better be view. Fine. If the right. restrooms end up going on the baseball side, then it would limit. The, it's just depending where we end up doing. And that ties to where we're bringing in our power and where we're bringing in um, our water. Well, we know it's very important to those yeah. two groups because the, the, the parents are working the games. Yeah, right. And they want to watch the kid play and work the games, too. Right. But, yeah. Well, and, well you also like maybe, the lines where people can see it while they're waiting in line. But maybe right. this, this <clears throat> new project, they can work out something. Having a, a decent concession stand, they can do just like football. JV works varsity. Varsity works JV. The same thing with baseball. Maybe they can... You know, change well, that up because right. because you can't see the game going on when you work concessions, and I've worked right. thousands. You know, so it's the issue. And I I brought that up. The issue with that, which hopefully we can solve at some point, is um, JV plays away, varsity plays home, and so the JV parents are going away to see their kids play, so they're not available. You know, and I've talked to the athletic directors. And of course, this goes back to other schools having lights. You know, I, I come from a, you know, from a district where every school had lights, and so we did JV varsity baseball and softball the same night at the same venue, at the same place, and so that we did that. Actually, the JV par or the the varsity mm -hmm. parents worked the JV game, then they, mm -hmm. they would flip, you know, which worked out just great. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm asking athletic directors to get more of those types of games because we're, we're going to have lights, so yeah. we could actually mm -hmm. do that right. when at our place, and it creates a great environment too when you have all going mm -hmm. at the same that's time. So and so, um, but yeah, that's that's probably the biggest obstacle there is getting, and and, and coaches like it as well. Coaches like for. Um, the, J, the varsity coaches like to watch JV teams play. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're their future players, yeah. and, and, and they can you know give a lot of good input mm -hmm. into those programs. So, so yeah, we'll um, you know hopefully work work on that. But um, so yeah, it should be doable. But we still haven't finalized that drawing, so it's just where I basically I'll locate that restaurant. Okay. We'll make it because that best. was a, that was a big issue for mm -hmm. parents. I'm gonna work real hard to <laughs> try to make that work. So I know that was, that was a huge issue. I understand. Yeah. I've, I've coached many of them, so I understand yeah. that. And then the other two parts of this project will be the lights and the, and the bleachers, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into the carryover funds. Phase three, we're in the development phase, and right now at that point we don't have much more to report on that. That's gonna be the concession stand and restrooms, which needs to be addressed on the football side as well, as, you know, and that's football track, lacrosse, and soccer. So all those sports and activities and it'll also be band camps and band competitions. Like we had band camp there about a week ago um, and used two of our schools for dormitories. Um, and so there'll be a lot more activity and use of those fields because with that synthetic turf, weather doesn't impact you. So we'll see a greater influx um, between all of those sports, including track. So all that will increase the activity in that complex significantly. Um, and so we'll need to address in phase three that concession stand restroom, particularly the restroom, even though the, the concession's small, but the restrooms are really small and from the, a number uh, standpoint, yeah. significantly. <laughs> and so bad. that <laughs> needs to be... Add that to are looking bad. Really <laughs> I just said, see, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not bad. sufficient for the crowds there we anticipate. Go. How's yeah, that? And I'll say this, too. You know, of course, How's putting, that, Ms. Vaughn? Putting <laughs> the crowd lane uh, track in, yeah. um, we've already, uh, Christopher already has uh, been approved to host the region track meet this coming year. And we put in for the state track meet this coming year wow. already, which, um, you know, we're competing against some other schools. But good sign, head of Virginia High School League actually came and looked at the facility the other day. And so uh, we're hoping we can get that. If, if we get a state track meet, it will bring hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. It will fill up hotels. 
it for will days. Uh, fill up yeah. restaurants. It is mm -hmm. a huge deal for the community. Mm -hmm. um, it's been in Harrisonburg for several years, but they're looking to move it, so we're hoping we get it. And it could, it could uh, I mean, for our community, the, our facility will pay for itself. There, there's no doubt about that. So, so I will keep you posted as we hear about that. And, um, mm -hmm. and I'm in contact with uh, um, Dr. Hahn, who's head of the Virginia High School League, um, politely asking him to, to give us that. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. So we're real excited about it. And, and um, it's going to be a, a great, great facility. And the following branch, um, I'd like to, first off, congratulate both our staff there at Falling Branch Elementary as well as the facilities team because and, and that's from the administration to the custodians to everybody on the team that's been there including purchasing in the warehouse and everybody with the furniture because they've taken let's just say a difficult construction project for a lot of different reasons and I'm not going to go into all the details but it's going to be ready for the start of school and you know, I think it's because while the contractors work hard, but I think our team from Montgomery County Public Schools is the reason why it's gonna open on time. And they need to be commended for their efforts and everything that they've done because they've gone above and beyond the call of duty in pulling this one off. Right now today, the interior works about 99% complete. Um, if you had asked that a week ago, it wouldn't have been close to that number. Um, we will still have paint and casework and punch list items to complete. The, the contractors are focused right now on painting and punch list and casework uh, with the goal to be out of there on or before August the 14th. Okay? Um, but they've come a long way. Teachers, we delayed them going into their rooms on Monday so that we could complete some things. They started coming in today and they're beginning to move into their space. On the exterior side, we're, we're still have to complete our fire lane, which is doable before the 14th. The landscaping is probably the one thing that is very questionable, whether that's gonna be right. ready on the first day of school, but that has no impact. That's something we can do during the school day or we can even do after hours. The parking lot is gonna be resurfaced and striped. The goal is to have that done by Tuesday. Um, the, the asphalt work is completed. Um, but they want to do their striping at one time. One thing that came up during the process is anytime you do a major renovation under Virginia code, you have to bring your life safety issues to compliance with the code today, not when the building was built. So there's some handicapped spaces that back when they were built, they could have a five degree slope. Today, code only allows a 2% slope. So all of that has to be re-engineered and reconfigured. That's in the process of being done both from an engineering standpoint as well as from an execution and construction standpoint. We believe that will be done by Monday and the goal is to be painting on Tuesday and doing all of our striping there. Um, the playground that's planned outside of where the bus loop is, uh, we've encountered some soil conditions and, and that is one problem we have run into on that site um, is the soils. Um, so right now the playground in all likelihood uh, will not be available when school opens. And that's that smaller one. They'll still have the big ones in the ball fields, but the one there in the bus loop won't be available. Completion date is August 14th. I put out to September 1st that if we just run into any weather issues or if anything does pop up, we'll still be doing punch list items in all likelihood through that date. But we won't be interrupting and in, in impacting any of our students in school. Other major summer projects, you have Harding Avenue, and that's a parking lot resurfacing, as well as a new sidewalk and entryway into the school. Um, that project is going to be completed on before August 15th. They're into the final stages right now. So it looks so um, nice. <laughs> it's come out very nice, yeah. but we're in the final touch-ups, and August 14th is the date. We'll easily meet that date. Gilbert Lincoln, we're doing the re-roof. Um, as you'll hear me say when we get into the carryover, I'm against partial re-roofs. I'm a believer that you do the whole building um, because anytime you do partials, it's difficult for new and old to bond and have good tie-ins. Um, but we're doing a partial there. Um, it's underway. The entire old roof has been removed from the school. Uh, we've dried it in, so everything's dry. We now have, when the weather comes in, we're not having flooding in the buildings. There's no leakage that are taking place. The new roof has been installed, it's about 65%. Uh, 
Um, there's a deck area that was damaged during the removal process. They repaired that today. Um, unfortunately, tomorrow's the weather, um, and so we'll get back to it probably on, uh, on Thursday and get back to it. Um, the completion, they're in liquidating damages, and that's one thing that we as a district have not enforced. It's something I do believe in. There's a contractual relationship. We have an obligation, and they have an obligation to us. Um, we right now put that out of September 15th. The roof itself and all the material will be on place before school starts in all likelihood. What will be left is the flashing and things that you really don't see too much of, but we need to complete. And, and that's, a t you know, that's a fairly long, it's about a week to two week time period, so they shouldn't have a problem with September 1st, but we've given them to a reasonable September 15th. Before you move into carry-on funds, if we can go back to fall breath just for one second, you were saying the playground that's by the bus loop wouldn't be ready, and that's for there's the, a yeah. fenced in that area is scheduled to be fenced in, and a smaller playground to be installed. That area, the fencing, the soils, as we put in one pole, yeah, as a contractor notice, it's just sinking too much right gotcha, now. Gotcha, and that's cool. Um, that playground equipment was pretty good, but I had. Uh, talked about concerns about the larger playground and when last time I was down there it was all construction zoned so you couldn't see what was going on but I'm hoping we did something there because I that, can't I really don't know that one I mean I'm I'm that's one I can find out for you Miss Bond and get back okay, to you because that's easy it was do. a must and we talked about it and a lot of people well you know the old schools different places didn't get and PTAs had to pay for it. but anytime we did new construction they got new playground. Let me say, if it's if it's a damaged playground, we'll, we will get take care of that pronto. Okay. Okay, but I'll I'll have. It's to, just not much there. I mean, right. I'll go swings, look. I just need to go. I just need okay. to go back there. Gotcha. It's just unfortunately with everything else, I just have not had the opportunity to get back gotcha. there yet. Okay. But we'll take care of that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So carryover funds, um, I broke it down into the two categories, which is spent revenues and expense. On the revenue side, you can see the budget, which was our final as adopted budget of $110.9 million. Our actual revenues came in at $112.3 million, a difference of $1.4 million. The bulk of that comes from the state. And that was primarily generated as a result of the increase in the ADMs that we had versus the budget. The budget last year, we utilized 9,450 students. We actually came in based off of our March 30th, where remember we got a large chunk of change in that fourth quarter of the fiscal year, came in at 9,637. So an increase of 100 and 49, well, no, sorry, 187 position students, which is an increase of 2%. So that drove that revenue, okay? And in this year's budget, we've projected it out using 9,608 students. Now, if we continue to see the influx, which we'll talk about Christiansburg Elementary in a second with carryover, if we continue to see that influx, which it appears we will, then we will anticipate another bump in that budget because our actuals will come in off of the actual ADMs, okay, at that time. But we've not used that in the carryover. On the expense side, this is what you would typically see as our carryover if you're looking at it year to year to year. And the bottom line, which line that says unspent appropriations of 387, and I'm sorry for the, I don't know, I was thinking periods instead of commas, but $387,985 that would be traditionally what, as a district, we've seen as our, car as our carryover into um, to the county. Okay? What we propose on our carryover funds, so we've included the revenue as well as the 387 on the expense, is $504,000 for Medicaid carryover, which is one we have every year. Typically, it's about 420 a PBIS grant of $8,700, a SPED grant of $1,600, and those are normal items that I've seen looking historical that I've seen in carryover from year to year. New would be the following. 
then this would be the request for the board to approve to move forward for us to go to the, to the, to the Board of Supervisors and seek their approval. The purchase of two buses and the related equipment being the zone or the GPS system that we now have in all of our buses. All of our buses have that zone or system. The development of options to begin to address the capacity challenge that Christiansburg Strand is facing. Now that's not something that I see with that, if you were to approve it, that would get spent immediately. It's something over the long haul because it's going to be a process and a lot of dialogue and sharing of information to come up with a, a sound plan that everyone's comfortable with and moving forward. To complete phase two on that CHS project and to begin, uh, final, to begin with possibly some of those funds into phase three. We've talked about that, that the budgets, the actual numbers on the CHS projects are coming in higher than the budgets were. And that's not taking a shot at any individual or anybody in the process, but as we're, we're fine tuning, as we're getting into the details of this particular project, things are popping up and it's, it's causing us to have numbers that are a little bit higher on our bid side than what we're initially projected. The other thing is, with, as Dr. Meyer said, with the state track meet, there's a large pile of dirt, topsoil, that's right behind the baseball complex. Um, that, that pile needs to be addressed. Um, as we start to go for state track meets and regional track meets, the size of the discus throwing area and the shot put throwing area need to increase than what's traditionally been there. Um, and so we probably will end up that whole back. So from the, from, you know, if I had the home side on this side and the visitor side here, from this part going toward our fence line, we will end up filling that in and making it level. So it becomes a usable space for our field events. Um, and we'll have to do some walkways so parents when they go to watch their children or coaches um, have access to those areas um, during the meets in the courses of, of the activity. Also, it'll help us when we do football games or band competitions. It gives us another means of getting into the stadium where you'll see we've got now a shell road that goes behind the tennis courts going into the, between tennis court and baseball field. That's going to be paved or we'll asphalted and then this will continue the asphalt. We can do the walk around around it. So the 450 is not just the completion of the original phase two, it also just ties up a lot of things with the project that would make it a clean, you know, when we, when we finish it, phase one and phase two are done. And there's nothing else left hanging out there. The worst thing I think to do is with this project and basically $3.9 million going in, to have a lot of open items, okay? So it looks partially done. You know, it's that 98%, but everybody's gonna remember the 2%. This way, we can ensure we get everything done and everything tied up, and then we're ready, you know, to start rolling on phase three. So that's where the 450,000 comes from. And then the remainder of it, capital repairs and maintenance. Right now, the three, we have three items and I haven't done a priority list. I've just done a, a partial priority, talking to the team. But two roofs, one at Biggs, one at CSS, we need about $650,000 of those two roofs today. And that was on the roof study. That was done many years ago. But that roof study said it'd be funded at about $2 million a year. We haven't funded it at that kind of number. Now I can tell you this, because we've had these conversations in my prior districts. If you look at the studies that are out there, if a building's gonna last 50 years, which is what every school shoots for with their buildings, a good rule of thumb on what needs to be invested in that building, and that includes the athletic complex, so it's the whole campus, is 2% of its replacement value should be invested year to year. Now, if you look at the total square footage this district has, which is about 2.8 million, if I remember my numbers right, it's about $14 million a year should be invested. Okay? Now, what happens when that, when that doesn't happen, which it doesn't, and that's, that's true throughout schools because there's just the, the, the question is always where we're going to get the money. But that gap doesn't stay the same over the future. It goes up. And then the other thing that happens is the failure rate is going to be great. 
thing, you'll have mass failures that'll take place. And I hope that never happens while I'm in Montgomery. I had enough of that in Richmond. We had enough here too. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I just don't need to have that <laughs> for a while. So what we have today between those two roofs and then CPS's mechanical system. CPS is the only school in the system with only one boiler. Every other school has two. If one that boiler goes down, you can't open schools. You don't have heat. The mechanical system there on HVAC is hanging by a thread. So each of those units run right at about $250,000 a piece up on the roof. That's another million two fifty. So combined, we're well over $2 million just on, and just, just three schools. And we haven't touched all the life safety related issues. I know of issues with asbestos in other, in other buildings because of the age of the building and what's above the ceiling line. So that $585,000 that we put down would be used for as we see the emergencies, which would be probably one of those three items that I've just addressed, but we'll come back to you with specifics, but that gives you an idea of where those funds will be earmarked to. Let me comment on a couple of um, these as well. Uh, first, the buses, um, the good news with that is it brings us to eight buses for the year, which is, that would be three years in a row, eight buses each year. And I've talked to you prior about the importance of the eight buses a year to keep on a consistent schedule. So that would actually do that. So that's a victory considering there's no money in the budget for, mm -hmm. there's no actual new money in the budget <laughs> yeah. for uh, buses. So that was, that was great. Um, <laughs> the, um, you know, addressing the capacity issues in Christiansburg, um, we're, we're over capacity at CPS and CES, yet we have empty classrooms now at Falling Branch. So, um, you know, the need to look at, um, you know, studying, redrawing lines to move some students to, the, to Falling Branch. That's going to be necessary to, to, for us to, to look at. Well, and I was going to say, there's just like, and I'm just using this as an example, where I live, my kids went to Fallen Branch, but the other side of the road, halfway down, they all went to Christian Elementary School. I so, mean, that's what was this crazy where it's, it's almost like not even laid out good. I mean, there's no better in Blacksburg because well, Rush I mean, Mountain half goes to Gilbert Lincoln's and half goes to Kipps. Well, and I get you got two sets of buses up the same mountain. And I, I was going to say, I get you got to have a line somewhere, somewhere, but you would think, like like I said, these kids out past me are going to, a, to you know, and it just didn't make any sense the way I was laid out. We're going to look at all that. Go ahead, let's and see. also we're going to look at um, the, the, we would like to look at the new elementary school and how the new line would be drawn. Right. Because what would be good about that, it would actually give uh, families possibly a few years, hopefully not too many years in advance notice of where the kid would be going to school at some point. You know, we anticipate um, that the most we could take from um, uh, CPS and CS between the two would be 100 to 150. And so that's about, say, 60 per school, okay, to go to Fallen Branch immediately or next school year. Well, Last year at this time, CES had 416 students. They're, I think, around 470 yes, some sir. now. Mm -hmm. So what we would do is, <laughs> we, all we'd be able to do is bring CES down to where they were last year at this time by, mm -hmm. yeah. by sending kids to Falling Branch. You know, the real, so, the real problem would not be, we would not be able to take any trailers out, right. okay? The real problem would be not be solved Un until the new elementary school is built and then we could get the trailers out of cps and ces and so um so what we'd be doing is keeping from adding new trailers yeah, yeah. right or making yeah. it miserable right because yeah. what's happened all right yeah we're shoving them in there yeah to, right. to, the to give you an update this week um <laughs> yesterday mm -hmm. with the numbers coming back from ces in fifth grade we're right at 25 and seven fifth grade classes oh. yeah. 25. So we added, um, you mm -hmm. know, through our LAPS funding, mm -hmm. uh, we, we looked at that and we were able to add one teacher. Um, and, and so luckily we had one room left mm -hmm. and it was the computer lab. 
Which we don't need as much anymore. Which we anymore. don't need now, yeah, mm -hmm. because we have the devices the now. Chromebook. So yeah. it, it worked perfect. So right. um, this year. That, this right. <laughs> yeah, we have that one room yeah. left. That was yeah. it. So, yeah. so we were able to empty out that, mm -hmm. um, and we're adding a classroom. We hired a teacher already today that did interviews. They found somebody who they liked, and so we've already offered that job. And so, um, but thinking about it, what's going to happen by adding a teacher in class of 25, you're going to only reduce the class size to about 22. Right. You know, in seven and then you're, to and then you're at what mm -hmm. we're at at BMS and BHS. Yeah. But it's for still class better than. It's better 25. It's better 25. Yeah. Right, right. I mean. Yeah. But I guess what I'm mean, saying is. And what do you do about things like it, the cafeteria? Where do you hit a. Well, that's a, a point problem. where you can't, you right. can't feed them anymore. Yeah. Right. I mean, because they They're already get their ten. food yeah. in one room and come down the hall and go in the gym. Mm -hmm where there's tables set up and that's where they eat. Well, they share, right, the gym and the cafeteria are the same. Yeah. And so that creates scheduling issues. Yeah. And so, so it's just, yeah. a, it's a little it's bit of a mess. Right, right, yeah. And, so, um, and so and that's, we, you know, the, the ideal, in, in an ideal world would to be, you know, obviously to wait until um, we get the other school built or do it to, to, redra to just to make sure we're right and get it done. But we can't wait. Yeah. We've got to that's move forward. Okay. And, and get, get some kids to call sure. And to say, in regards to whoever designed CPS back in the day, because I was the first year that went there, and mm. it was designed, and that might have been the way they did things back then, yeah, the was, lunch cart schools. came around, and mm -hmm. you got your lunch tray and sat in your classroom. So they didn't need right. that lunch room. It was just, di that's how right. it was done. That's how it was done. Exactly. And that was the new thing for the time, right. you know, so. And a smaller population of right. students. Right. And so then, oh, how cool to have this open and everybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we'll just go from classroom to classroom and they'll eat their lunch at their desk. And they had a process. Mm -hmm. But so that's kind of why that was that way. But, you know, it don't work now. So. No, it doesn't. In fact, you know, that's one of our CPS and, of course, Harding are Two of our uh, 70s buildings yeah. and and as we know the 70s buildings are being They're replaced now <laughs> prior to the 50s and 60s buildings right I mean, they, it was just horrible construction during that time and so um so yeah so we christiansburg is booming and so it's it's in blacksburg is packed it's everywhere. Everywhere. i mean Romania. it's just it's, it's everywhere you know and and you know auburn um elementary um mm -hmm. we're packed at auburn <laughs> El right. elementary yeah. Mm -hmm. goes back and we here, right we're, I mean, we're just a couple classes away, everywhere. having everywhere. making decisions at Auburn Elementary School, right, Miss Saddle? <laughs> you know, yeah. and so um, <laughs> if it's uh, yeah. So th the good news is we're getting more kids, which is creating more funding um, from the the state. The bad news we're getting more kids, and we, we're having problems <laughs> finding places to put them, right. creating overcrowded classrooms, yeah, and that kind of thing. It doesn't come um, with yeah. The state sends you money to teach them, but not money to provide facilities. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so stopped doing that a long time ago. Just, just curious, out of curiosity, if we had the land already, how, what, what is the timeline with the PPEA? We expect, we expect one to be delivered in the next 30 days. So if no. one were delivered in the no. next 30 days and things were to go just perfect. Mm -hmm. How long would it take to build an elementary school? To, to to get get so yeah. you'd be looking yeah. at the 45 day period for advertisement, your reviews to so say you're at 60, you've got to go from concept, well you can do conceptual depending, let's say it's just one that comes in. You could go from conceptual to your contract you're probably looking at, honestly, 60 days to get a contract executed and make sure you've dotted every I's and crossed your T's. So you're 120 days out. Once you've got that and say the site's there, you would begin your design work. Once you've got the basic design, not your detail yet, but you've got your basic design and your layout, you can go and get your permit to do your site work, which would be the thing to do. Start site work in month five or six complete your, your design work so that once you've completed site, then you're looking at basically a 12 month, easily 12 month period to have the building ready because you just go straight from site to your construction. So about 18 months. About 18 months. So I wanna go back to the talking about where lines were drawn. Remember those lines were drawn a long time ago mm -hmm. and the county has grown mm -hmm. inside those lines. So it yeah. may seem kind of crazy now, 
but it made sense at one point. And so and so sure. now we have to make it make yeah. sense again. Yeah. Unfortunately, exactly. the county didn't yeah. grow where it was supposed to, like where supposed it was supposed to grow. To. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I, I know you got to have lines somewhere, like the road would define the district type lines, and I get that. It was just odd that, like I said, my kids went to Fallen Branch, and all of these kids went to CES. Yeah. Because you know? and I'm not going, all those kids were there years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and so, that's true, but yeah. Yeah. why would they send them here instead of sending them there? You know, I don't know. So it, just, it was just odd. I'm sure I'm, there was a reason. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm, You're well, exactly right. It's just, just like that there's got to be a line somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So is it the will of the board that we can proceed with the carryover as we present it? Because I need to get that approved, if that's y'all's desire, so I can take it to the Board of Supervisors. So that brings us to the draft. To the draft of the... <laughs> Yeah, the letter is a standard, right. our standard right. form letter. It's the numbers as we present in the category. So may I have a motion to approve the, uh, the letter, request for supplemental appropriation for the county at this time? And the exact amount, could we state what that is that we're asking? Mm -hmm. Yes, here? it is, let's see, uh, excess revenue of I'm coming there. Three thousand eight hundred. Three hundred and eighty-seven. Three hundred eighty-seven thousand nine hundred eighty-six. Is that it? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So the total is one point seven million. That that's there is being allocated amongst all of those different categories. But we will emphasize to the board of supervisors. That technically only four hundred, that less than four, three hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars was left from last from year's last budget. The other we one spent, is on state. Yeah, money. we spin it down. Yeah. I mean that's that's pretty, about as low as you could possibly get. Yeah. So we did a great job at managing our money this. Oh, it did a tremendous yeah. job. Yeah. I mean to get it down this, to three hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars. And just yeah. to clarify, this is our carryover. Yes, ma'am. We're yeah. asking them to give back to us. Yes, ma'am. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And all of it's going into Sometimes education. Sometimes get confused between that and their carryover. Yeah. yeah. Right. No, ma'am. This is not the county. Okay. Okay. So you asked for a motion. So I have a motion to approve the supplemental appropriation. Yeah. So moved. Yes. Yeah. Second. I have a motion. Second. Any other questions for Mr. Kress? Thank all in you. favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We approve the letter. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So one last item, and then I'll go sit down and shut up. Um, <laughs> on our health savings account, which we opened up a year ago, um, the IRS has changed the um, the amount that can go into the account. So on the employee only, it went from thirteen twenty a year to thirteen fifty. On the the family, basically from twenty six forty to twenty seven hundred. We are requesting as an administration to go to those numbers, continue to fund it at that level. The estimated financial impact to the district is about $15,000, and that's easily absorbed with inside of our operating budget today. Are you asking for a motion? Tonight? Yes, ma'am, if you would. I have a motion to approach. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I was just looking. It was late to look at the slides. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the health savings account uh, plan proposed changes as presented? Motion. Second. I have a motion and second. Any other questions regarding that, uh, Mr. Kranz? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We approve the changes as Thank you. proposed. Thank you. Okay, just close it, just close it. Good. All right, next, um, school crisis plans. School board must certify school crisis plans each year. The plans are available at the school board office for your review. We'll ask you to certify the plans at the August 21st school board meeting. Mm -hmm. Any questions about that? Okay. Any big changes on those? Anybody knows? Ms. Dix, any big changes in the school crisis? Plans? I know there are big, 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 a lot of big binders, and I went through them once. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> I will, I, if I don't have to, I don't want to look through them again. 
But I'd like to know what I'm improving. So, uh -huh. so actually, we did. We, we adopted the new model that was put up at DCGS a couple of years ago. Okay. And so there are some changes. Okay, so it will be nice to look at so, it. So, so, I'll so is, is there <laughs> any way we can get that, that portion? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I'll tell you, I, you know, okay. here's what I Summary can do. of changes in yeah, the there we go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Here's what a we summary? can do that will give you a nice summary of it. Actually, I sent it out to, uh, I tweeted it out actually during the, the um, conference last week. There's a great DCJS uh, video online explaining that process. Mm. Um, it's okay if I just send that to you. It's about be great. Uh, 20 minutes maybe of a video. I sent it to actually, I, I sent it out and, and actually where parents could see what we do and how we do it and how yeah. it works and, and that That's kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I will, I will send that to you, and so or you can go back and look up my tweets. You know, so, <laughs> send sorry. it to me, please. <laughs> I'll send it to you. <laughs> Too many tweets. <laughs> Thank I'm you. Sorry. <laughs> You tweet a lot, okay? <laughs> Just a couple times. We're sitting there scrolling now. I am. It. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Now we are at unfinished business. Any unfinished business the board members would like to? I have discussed. I just have a question. This is kind of a fun question. When I got my little bus, the hundred thousand bus, it sits on my station, and I think everybody that comes in there every day comments on that bus. <laughs> and one of the main questions is, and only because we talked about buses before, I'm doing an unfinished business. They're like, well, they're gonna. Is the number gonna be one hundred thousand? Is that what we're going to? I mean, oh, I ride bus one hundred thousand. I mean, is that gonna be it, or is it gonna be like one? I mean, one of our numbers, we can't, we cannot. We can't have I, I think I plan like a kindergartner. They're getting on bus one hundred thousand. I don't have a clue. Can I? I think the plan was to also, but also leave that number on there. Okay. We are for, for identification purposes. Sure. But as far as the students, it's going to be a regular bus number. Gotcha. <laughs> we should, I just had to ask because, like I said, every day somebody asks me that question. Well, my my question uh, was to Eddie at the time of the presentation was, who's actually getting it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Who, who gets the luxury of driving that? I'm not sure. <laughs> same bus. as every other bus. <laughs> same bus. <laughs> same bus. <laughs> Uh, any more unfinished business or questions? And then the next item is new business. Are there any matters of new business board members that you can think of? Hearing none, how about announcements and information? Our school staff opening convocation day is Monday. Glad you said that. I was just gonna say, even though we have help at work now, and I could actually go. I have a doctor's appointment that I made about four months ago, and it is Monday morning in Salem at 8.15, and I am not canceling. No, so wish everybody well, good luck, good start, <laughs> and <laughs> but I won't be there. And it is at 8 o'clock, and it is in yeah. Christiansburg High School. Mm -hmm. And uh, any other announcements? Um, you I know yeah. dialogue on so race. On the, right, on the 25th. The Dialogue on Race will be starting at 5 o'clock at Caboose Park. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have everyone come. Focus this year will be law enforcement. 25th, I think, Saturday. 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 Any other announcements for members that you can think of? If not, you'll see the upcoming school board meetings. on the 21st and September 4th. And after that, we are ready to enter the closed session if you don't have anything else. Our next order of business is closed session. I have a motion to go into closed session to discuss one personnel matter as authorized by section 2.2-3711 of Code of Virginia. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Now we're in closed session. <laughs>